and uh, good morning to all and uh, we are starting uh, now our conference uh, in uh, uh, plenary report uh, please uh, Lauren Fournier from French uh, ethnic and confessional interactions in Fra in uh, France uh, between history and anthropology please thank you thank you very much uh, Silvistis I am very happy to, to meet you all today um, to make a report uh, about the situation in France regarding the topic of our conference. Um, so uh, the title of my uh, talk is Ethnic and Confessional Interactions in France between History and Anthropology, because I, I, as you will, will see, uh i i i have relied on uh, on historical material quite a lot uh to uh, to build up this talk i have um, a, a a powerpoint i will try to to uh, share so here it is i think it's okay yes uh, now i think you can see it yes uh, uh, yes, we can see it. The first slide we see. Uh, it. Uh, partir du début. Yes, here you can oh, see the. the that's, that's the, good. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. good. Yes. So um, the the question of religious and ethnic inter in, in, in well the question of religious and ethnic cultural interactions in France is in a way um, a taboo question. And I will try to explain that. Th this seems uh, difficult to understand at first sight, because um, in a country like France, uh, you often think about uh, uh, human and citizen rights, and uh, France indeed presents itself as the homeland of human and citizen rights. So it is maybe difficult to understand why the question of uh, religious and cultural interactions uh, is a taboo. But it is uh, precisely uh, the universalist character of the 1789 Declaration of Human Rights that makes it difficult to recognize the cultural characteristics of the different ethnic minorities in France. The problem of ethnicity is in France a cultural question which cannot really be included easily in the official political agenda because French policy wants to be above all universalistic. And that is to say that the French politics always want to address to all citizens uh, indiscriminately without prejudices of classes, of races, of cultures, of ethnics and of religions. And at the same time, the debates on the word culture in France are most often limited to the notion of high culture, that is to say the field of fine arts and literature. And it is very difficult for ethnic minorities in France to assert their cultural specificities in the anthropological sense of the term at the risk of appearing secessionist and of being accused of endangering the national unity. There is a term for that, the term commun communitarianism. And this term is labeling the, the people who uh, try to uh, um, address uh, ethnic or religious issues. This term, commun communitarism, commun communitarianism, um, has been regularly used to prevent any drift that would aim to give a specific status to the culture of one community rather than another. This situation has implications in politics, in the field of the defense of ethnic minorities, and also in the religious field where Republican secularism, uh, we call that laïcité in France, secularism, is always preferred to the affirmation of community religious aff affiliations. This doctrine, republican universalism and secularism, 
is conceived as a bulwark against the risks of weakening national identity. Of course, it also feeds a number of frustrations on the part of minorities and communities who consider that they are not sufficiently recognized by the Republican state. This debate between the universality of human rights and cultural particularisms has various challenges at the same time, historical, political, legal, and religious, of which I will try to account in anthropological and critical terms today. And I hope that this case study uh, focusing on my country, on France, which is my country of, re of origin and of residence, may be useful on a more general level to understand issues related to inter-ethnic cooperation or intercultural dialogue, whether found in all countries of the world. At the, uh, so to fully understand uh, the stakes of our debate, I will begin by referring to the complicated relations between Catholics and pro Protestants in France in history, and especially during the early modernity in the 16th century. In France, we call wars of religion, a series of eight conflicts, which were civil wars, religious wars, and military operations, which devastated the kingdom of France in the second half of the 16th century, and in which Catholics and Protestants were opposed. Here is a map of France in the 16th century, uh, where you can see in, in purple the places uh, uh, held by the Protestants, the Huguenots, and um, on the grey parts is the Catholic uh, France. From the 16th century, a schism provoked by the ideals of Protestant Reformation led to opposition between Protestants and Catholics in a form of a bloody civil war. The first persecutions against those who adhered to the new Protestant ideas began in the 1520s. But it was not until the 1540s and 1550s to see the cleavages assert themselves. At the end of the reign of King Henry II in 1559, the conflict became politicized. The wars of religion began in 1562 and continued interspersed with periods of peace until the end of the 16th century, when the Edict of Nantes, Nantes is uh, in the west of France, the Edict of Nantes was promulgated in 1598. The wars of religions Con continued in the, fifth, in the 17th century and in the 18th century until the end of the persecution of the Protestants under uh, Louis uh, the 16th in uh, 1787. The wars of religion coincide with a weakening of royal authority. Kings Francois I and Henry II did not allow any challenge to their power. But when Henry II died ac accidentally in 1559, his successors, Francois II and Charles IX, were too young to be able to impose their authority. They could not present, prevent the French from tearing each other apart. Between the two belligerent camps, the very influential King Queen Mother Catherine de Medici from Italy um, hesitated between religious tolerance and repression, which only accentuated the tensions. The, king, the kings being too young to rule, different political camps were trying to impose them, themselves to control royal power. Three large aristocratic clans moreover all linked by various family ties, will then oppose each other. The, the Guise, the Duc de Guise, the Duke of Guise, led the Catholic party, the Bourbon, the Protestant party, 
and the Montmorencys opposed the Guise, the Guise in the race for power. The wars of religion were also due to the interference of neighboring countries, which kept the unrest in order to better weaken the kingdom of France. To lower France, Spain and England never ceased to lend a hand to rebel subjects. The Queen of England, Elizabeth I, intervened by supporting the Protestants and the King of Spain by supporting the Catholics. During the wars of religion, France was then divided into two factions supported financially and militarily by foreign countries. During the 1580s, France even seemed to become a battleground where Spain and England clashed through parties. The first religious troubles appeared during the reign of François I in the beginning of the 16th century. Despite his inclination for humanism, uh, the king considered the reformation harmful to, this, to his authority. Uh, from 1534, the king began to persecute the Protestants. In 1545, uh, 3,000 of them were massacred in uh, the south of France in the order of uh, uh, the king. It was during the reign of uh, uh, another king, Henry II, that the religious tension increased, and that is in the middle of the 16th century when the king put in place anti-Protestant legislation and multiplied repressive edicts. Despite this persecution poli policy, Protestantism was booming. The, repres the repression desired by the king remained limited by the weakness of his institutions. The king did not have uh, sufficient important juridic uh, authority to implement his policy. The edicts were poorly enforced, and a lot of officers sympathized with the Reformation. Protestantism spread especially in urban areas among people who had access to culture, the bourgeois, the craftsmen, the church people, the scholars, the writers, the judicial officers. Everybody wanted to become a Protestant. The French nobility came herself uh, to the reformation at the, in, the, in the same period, in the middle of the 16th century, and great figures of the court, of the royal court, uh, contribute to the development of Protestantism. Um, the height of Protestantism in France is in the year 1561. There were already about 2 million Protestants in this country, and uh, um, more than 600 or se uh, 600 reformed church in the kingdom. It is estimated at this time that ne nearly a tenth of the kingdom population is Protestant. And the animosity uh, becomes extreme between Catholic and, and Protestants at, uh, at the end of this year, uh, 1561. The country is then on the brink of a religious crisis. Depending on a domiliary clientelism, the, the gentleman and the, and the, the gentry uh, choose the Protestant party or uh, the Catholic party, and uh, uh, they, they fight uh, against each other. <clears throat> we can distinguish, as I said, eight uh, civil wars, eight wars of religion uh, from 16, 1562 to 15. 98, the last one turning in a classical war against the King of Spain who supported uh, the Catholic League. In, in fact, France experienced 36 years of turmoil with only two periods of relative uh, calm, and the culmination of the wars of religion is known as the Saint Barthélemy uh, massacre. Here you have a, a painting by uh, François Dubois about this, uh, this massacre, where more than 3,000 Protestants were, were killed. And that was uh, on August 24th, uh, 1572 in, in Paris and in, other, and in other cities as well, in, in France, in the main cities as well. Um, 
Henry IV, Henry the Fourth, uh, was um, the one, the, the king who who managed to to end uh, these uh, interreligious problems in early modern France. King uh, Henry the Fourth uh, was uh, baptized as a Catholic, but then he was brought up in the Reformed uh, Protestant uh, religion, and he was in for, uh, he was involved in the wars of religion um, because he was a, a prince of the blood of the French dynasty and also a leader of the Protestant uh, nobility. He abjured uh, Protestantism in uh, 1572 uh, and become uh, a Catholic uh, in at the time of the Saint Barthélemy uh, massacre. And then he turned back to Protestantism four years later. And um, he settled, uh, in a way, the, the, the Protestant problem by adopting an edict of tolerance, uh, which is the, the edict of, of Nantes in uh, 1598. The edict of Nantes established in France for uh, nearly one century, a situation which is considered as deeply original and which celebrates the, which is often celebrated as the birth of tolerance in Europe between, uh, between religions. In fact, the edict is not a very exceptional piece of religion. Uh, if we keep in mind the regulations of religious coexistence in Poland, in Hungary, in Transylvania, and uh, in, uh, in the empire, in the Austro-Hungarian empire, um, but uh, this edict established a Catholic state in which Protestantism is tolerated but remains disadvantaged. Indeed, the edict proclaims the re-establishment of the Roman religion, the Catholic religion, wherever it has ceased to be practiced, and uh, of the churches and ecclesiastic property to their first owners, whereas Protestant worship cannot be exercised freely everywhere. So it is some, some sort of re-Catholicization of the, of, the, of the kingdom. Um, this early modern historical context is important to understand because it largely determines the subsequent philosophical and political debates which in the 18th and in the, in the 18th century will prepare the French Revolution of 1789. In France, the universalist ideals of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, prepared by the work of René Descartes already in the 17th century and concretized on the intellectual level by the writing of the Encyclopedia by Diderot and d'Alembert, who published 17 volumes uh, in the second part of the 18th century, will be systematically turned down towards the cult of reason and the rejection of religious divisions who are considered to be uh, fratricidal. This will result in a certain mistrust vis-a-vis -vis the culturalist assertions, which at the same time develop in Germany among philosophers like Johann Gottfried Herder, inspirer of romanticism and creator of the concept of Volksgeist. In France at that time, the notion of Volksgeist uh, is already suspect, and authors like Montaigne have uh, long popularized skeptical humanism and critical relativism, which lead with him to consider that what is a truth on one side of the Pyrenees is a lie beyond. Rousseau also has valued the good sauvages, but um, he opposes them to more uh, civilized people. We have to understand that in the philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, savages and civilized are ideal types that reflect advanced states of humanity and archetypical uh, figures. They do not refer to particular people whose uh, cultural specificities should be protected. The progression of the ideas of the Enlightenment will strengthen popular demand for more social justice, which will culminate in the Great Revolution of 1789. Like any revolution, the French Revolution had also economic causes, 
But the specificity of the French Revolution is that it proposed a democratic system that wants to be universal. The new Republican political system is built on the ruins of the old system, imposing a modernity that rejects the legacy of the past. The example of the unification of weights and measures speaks volumes in, in this regard. The, all the old units of account were abolished and replaced by the decimal system. The calendar itself was reformed. The old divisions for the year in 12 months and weeks and seven days were deleted. deleted. A new universalist religion was created with divisions following the cycle of the, the, cycle of the seasons, 10-day weeks, and festivals dedicated to the different ages of life. To better serve the reason, the all-powerful reason and the, unifer, the universal notion of reason, religious congregations were banned, churches destroyed, and bells men, melted. And here you have the example of the Republican calendar, which, uh, which follows the, the seasons instead of uh, having the traditional Christian uh, months. <clears throat> the revolution of 1789 is also a period where the new concept of cultural heritage was asserted, which was, which was a concept uh, proposed in order to put at the service of the collective good the wealth which was held by the nobility and by the religious uh, order pr previously. The first museums like uh, Le Louvre in Paris was were conceived as repositories where the citizens of the new society could educate themselves by pondering the mistakes of the past. The example of the ancient republics of, of the Greek Republic and of Rome were invoked uh, to uh, justify the new political order. And the new regime was entirely backed by the, idea, uh, by the ideas of reason and progress which are ideas which must be applied universally, which will justify the Napoleonic war of contest. Napoleon was a revolutionary leader before becoming an emperor, and his conquering proposals were justified by the desire to extend the Republican system to all the other European states. Caesars of works of art by Napoleon were legitimized by the need to liberate the art uh, from the inegalitarian monarch monarchical uh, systems. In this context, freedom and equality were the keywords of the new Republican ideology. But the problem with equality is that is the, it does not assert the assertion of cultural, ethnic, or religious differences. From the early years of the revolution, uh, voices were raised to demand the right of regional peoples to speak their dialects, but revolution was, was synonymous with progress, and these voices were most often perceived as anti-revolutionary appeals. And then the whole of the 19th century was to be characterized by a trend towards standardization on the scale of the uh, French national territory, not only of customs and beliefs, but also of language learning. This standardization imposed as a necessary modernization effort will affect the French metropolitan regions, as well as the colonies and the French overseas departments. And this is the time in the 19th century when the children in in French equatorial Africa, were taught to identify themselves with our ancestors, the Gauls. And uh, this unification effort, based on a revolutionary search for civil equality, continued for several decades, in particular under the Third Republic between 1870 and 1939. So this is quite near from us. In this context, specific to France, which has well been studied by the historians, folklorism and cultural regionalism have existed, but always in a secondary way, as checks and balances. And they were 
only uh, taken seriously insofar as they could serve the project of a national unity. Certain ethnological museums were created, for example, in the Basque country, in Brittany or in Provence in the end of the 19th century, in these regions which have a stronger identity. But in the same time, the children of these regions were punished when they spoke their regional languages, which leads today to some critical uh, intellectuals to speak about glottophobia. Uh, here, an announcement for school children. It is forbidden to speak Breton dialect and to split on the ground. According to uh, uh, some critical authors today, the French trend toward egalitarianism has led not only to banning regional dialects and languages, but also to preventing people who speak French with a too strong regional accent from accessing uh, positions of responsibility in the French state. These debates, which mainly concern regional cultures and ethnicity, extend to the level of religion. We have seen the importance of the historical trauma caused by the religious wars between um, Catholics and Protestants in early modernity. At the time of the revolution of 1789, the new power intends to make tabula rasa of the religious past and a new Republican religion is instituted. Then in the 19th century, it is necessary to point out the place held by the search for new philosophical systems, which intend to replace traditional religions. Positivism is thus thought of as a new religion by uh, Auguste Comte. Um, and uh, um, this uh, religion of humanity or positivism can be compared to uh, the religious attempts of the French Revolution the cult of reason in October and November 1793, the cult of the supreme being in 1794, the theophilanthropy in 1796, etc. It is to make a synthesis between the traditional religions and the new values of modernity. And uh, new calendars are imagined in this way. Uh, Auguste Comte uh, uh, used uh, uh, Moses, Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras as uh, uh, important saints in the new uh, uh, calendar he, he was uh, building under the positivist motto, uh, order and progress. So uh, through the 19th century, against the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution and the gradual rise of the labor movement, increasingly heated struggles between positive progressive Republicans and conservative Catholics were to be observed. And in 1905, uh, this led to a, a law, uh, the law of the separation of the church and the state. And here you have some caricatures from uh, 19, here the, you have uh, uh, the, the legislator uh, cutting the rope between the state and the church, and here it's and on the on the other, it's about the same uh, same theme. Here, the the, legisla the, the legislator cutting the, the rope, cutting the link between the between the church and the, and the state. And this uh, law was adopted on uh, December the 9th, ninth, uh, nineteen o five at the initiative of a Republican socialist deputy, Aristide Briand, and it is one of the founding acts of the secularization of the French state, which concludes a, a series of violent confrontations with, which opposed, um, which opposed uh, the, the different conceptions of the place of the churches in French society um, in the last uh, decades. To understand the need for this law, uh, we can quickly retrace its genesis. Um, the first separation between the, 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 the church and the state was established indeed by the National Convention in 1794. So that's during the, the, the Great uh, Revolution, which abolished 
the budget of the constitutional church and uh, uh, was a, a decree of, uh, fr on freedom of worship, um, which specified already in 1794 that, uh, I quote, uh, the Republic does not pay any religion. Um, then uh, this separation ended with the signing of the Concordat uh, by Napoleon uh, with the Pope, which reconciled uh, the state and the church in the 19th century. And in 1905, it's a new, the, the new uh, way of breaking uh, between the, 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 the French government and the, and, the, and the Catholic Church. This law is important because it invented the French, si French style secularism or laïcité. It proclaims freedom of consciousness. It guarantees the free exercise of worship and lays down the principle of separation of church and uh, state. And um, uh, this, um, this law is, uh, is, is still uh, very much discussed today. Uh, since 1905, la, la laïcité, uh, secularism, designates in France a set of principles relating to the place of religion in society. From a legal point of view, it is a constitutional principle which separates political power from religious organizations. In a more political and philosophical sense, la laïcité, secularism, can also mean a desire to prevent the hold of a confession on society by ensuring, in addition, the neutrality of the state and the confinement of the religious fact to the private sphere. Um, to come to an end of this talk, uh, the historical, I will examine quickly the consequences today of, this, uh, of these historical facts. Uh, the host historical elements that I have presented so far explain uh, the current difficulties that exist in France in considering the issue of ethnic and cultural and religious cultural interactions. Um, they show the importance of the historical dimension for thinking about uh, contemporary intro anthropological uh, problems. So here, uh, some cartoons from today. So here it's President François Hollande, uh, who is presenting the centenary uh, the, of the law, uh, and uh, the, the, the priest, the imam and the, uh, rab the, the Jew rabbin uh, uh, tell him, well, well, this is a text uh, which is more than 100 years old, so uh, it's maybe a bit out of date. And um, uh, here you have uh, uh, the, uh, the school, uh, which is uh, presented as a sponge, uh, uh, and the Republic washes the, the different uh, communitarisms and the different claims for religious uh, communities or ethnic communities to have their own. So, so the Republic is all white and washes all these uh, communities, but you see that the communities have the colors of, of, the, French, uh, of the French flag. So uh, uh, this uh, issue of our conference was the occasion for me to discuss the difficulties uh, linked to the integration of uh, people of immigrant origin who often come from uh, former French colonies. I have shown so far that the French nation was built in the denial of its international, internal uh, diversity as at the cost of major integration efforts made by regional minorities. In France, after several generations of Republican integration, it is not very well accepted to claim to be Provençal, to be Basque, to be Breton, to be Alsatian from the different regions of France, uh, because this seems to encourage cultural inequalities. The French Republican Universalist model, therefore, is hardly compatible with the ideals of multiculturalism, which are observed, for example, in Canada or in the United States, in countries which were built largely by migration. In France, for several decades, the problem of integrating minorities has been posed in the context of decolonization, first of all through the reception 
given to Algerians and Tunisians who wanted to join France after the independence of their countries in the 1960s, then through the independence demands of the overseas departments like the Antilles, West Indies, and the Pacific. Uh, thus, the universalist and secular foundations of the Republic are regularly discussed in public debate. For example, in 2004, uh, President, uh, well, uh, at, at this time, Minister uh, Nicolas Sarkozy uh, wondered if, he, if we could mo modify uh, the 1905 law uh, um, because uh, this would uh, enable to uh, better control the financing of uh, religions to free the French Muslim religion from the tutelage uh, of foreign countries uh, Saudi Arabia especially, and uh, thus to uh, be able to limit the influence of external countries on the mus Muslim community in, in France. Uh, Sarkozy asks, uh, maybe we should uh, do uh, the job ourselves. So this uh, control was, would imply the facilities uh, uh, to train religious office, officials, by, for example, by providing teachers in non-religious uh, subjects for the training of priests, pastors, or uh, imams. The risk that is often pointed out is that uh, the laïcité doctrine, by not intervening in ethnic and cultural affairs, practically reinforces uh, community and communitarianism and the possibilities of radicalization. Thus, it would maybe be better to accept uh, cultural diversity than to uh, deny it. Social anthropology, uh, which at the same time has developed a critical discourse vis-a-vis -vis culturalism, is uncomfortable with these questions because it does not want to encourage ethnic uh, faults. Moreover, the populist far right holds an ethnicist discourse aimed at stigmatizing visible minorities um, which has resulted in regular debates uh, about the wearing of the Muslim veil in public spaces, for instance, in the last years. In terms of cultural, ethnic, and confessional in interactions, France is therefore currently caught between two contradictory imperatives. On the one hand, taking into account the historical heritage which encourages universality and the abstract equality of all citizens and does not recognize cultural diversity, and on the other hand, accept the reality of contemporary ethnic and religious claims. Compared to other countries, France seems to have a longer experience in these issues, especially because of its political history and of its colonial past. But that does not help this country to think of ethnicities in the present time. On the contrary, the principles resulting from the past are too often an obstacle to the recognition of cultural minorities today, whether they are regional or coming from former colonies or caused by new uh, migratory uh, phenomena. To conclude, I would say that uh, this situation makes it more necessary than ever, than ever to deploy international comparisons in order to work in a spirit of tolerance. Um, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Lauren, for a very interesting uh, report. Uh, and we have a few minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, more time for questions and comments we'll have uh, in the final discussion. And uh, please, uh, one or two questions. Well, may I ask you, uh, thank you so much for this profound uh, presentation and deep look into the uh, path or um, past of uh, France and uh, the um, development of ideas. And I wonder uh, how these uh, 
uh, how this universalists uh, pattern of uh, French uh, uh, French thought of a French uh, perception of uh, cultures, ethnicities, uh, etc., corresponds with the main ideas of uh, uh, European Union. Uh, uh, do they uh, clutch or? Uh, no, or or, or uh, have uh, things in common yeah this is this is a fascinating question i think nina uh, because uh, for sure uh, the the french universalistic models model has uh, uh, inspired a lot of republics and a lot of political systems uh, since uh, 1789 and uh, a lot of other republics have been influenced but also uh, for sure the uh, the European Union uh, when it was founded in, in the in the 1950s. However, um, there is another uh, something else uh, which is the 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 idea the modern idea of, of a region. I mean the, the region in in the in the city planners uh, perspective. And I think that uh, uh, the the region uh, Europe uh, has also been built up. Through the regional perspective in the 70s, in the in the 80s, in the 1980s, and 19 and the end of the 20th century, when uh, uh, when the, the, the notion of a region as an economic uh, uh, territory uh, was was risen. So uh, this is so on the one side, I think uh, you're uh, you have a, a right um, uh, feeling that the that the the, politi the, U, the EU political system uh, is is inspired by, uh, by, uh, by by the French universalist system, but on the other hand, on the there is also this economic idea of uh, uh, regional development or local development, which accompanied the the, the rise of uh, EU uh, in the in the from from the 1960s 70s onwards. So so. I would answer in these two um, mm -hmm. directions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, one uh, question in chat. How does the refugee crisis affect uh, the discourse of different in modern friends, uh, France? Mm. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 refugee, the refugee crisis uh, enforces uh, quite a lot the uh, far right uh, wing uh, discourse. Uh, this would be the answer because uh, the far right uh, um, is very uh, uh, afraid by the visible uh, minorities and by the, the, this problem of integration, uh, especially people coming from Muslim countries. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, this debate with, which is very very strong uh, in France. And uh, one uh, uh, consequence is that uh, uh, people from the left wing uh, also tend to, 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 to go from the, from the far left to the far right. So there are some uh, political effects uh, here, uh, which are of course uh, important. So thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, more questions and uh, comments uh, later, and uh, now we'll begin the panel number three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for you. And uh, panel number three, religion, rituals, and celebrations under extreme conditions. Uh, Chief uh, uh, Aquile Matuzaite, and uh, we have uh, Two reports uh, and one virtual, uh, virtual poster. Please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. And it's my pleasure to join your conference. Thank you very much. So we continue our conference and uh, and the panel three uh, with the another presentation by Tatiana Miniakimetova and Ranus Sadikov. The paper um, is Religious Ritual Arrangements Under Extreme Conditions, the examples of the trans Kama Udmurts. You are very welcome. 
Hello. Do you see, hello. Yes. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. It's okay. yes we see. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, my dear friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm sorry. Perhaps now we open this. We are very glad to participate on this conference with my colleague Ramu Sadikov from Russia. For, uh, and many thanks, Gilvitis and other organizers. It was really, uh, as said Nina Vlaskina, very comfortable to know every step of uh, prepa uh, preparations and organizing uh, things and moments of the conference. So let me to read my paper. Since ancient times in various cultures, traditional calendar year considers unusual periods. All seasonal chains are predetermined. In the same way, before any important events in life of individuals or family, kinship group, community, any specific periods of time are provided, which should be paid special attention to for to the successful course of life. Most cases, these transitional periods of time are endowed with negative symbolism. They are perceived as dangerous, impure and wrong, since they are characterized by an imbalance between the forces of space and chaos, between heaven and earth, as well as a change in the normal biological and social rhythm of life. To establish balance, many rituals and actions have been developed. Behavioral norms are provided according to the time of year, the performance of certain work, and thanks to such attitudes, such dangerous periods of time are no longer perceived as extraordinary. They are known from time immemorial. This is how the ancestors did, and being cautioned against them, one should take any preventive actions and measures, which is still performed in the form of rituals with all its rules and norms. Extreme cases such as natural and climatic disasters, wars, epidemics, and mass diseases, hunger and famine, unexpected and horrific disasters affecting everyone and everything are perceived differently. These dangerous and serious disasters in life are somewhat similar and therefore their perception is also accordingly. However, they can be viewed as two types of phenomena based on the actions taken in relation to them. Our paper is based on our field materials collected primarily among the Transcama group of Udmurts for several decades up to the present day. We will expand some points by drawing on published data from the available literature. In the calendar year, there are several parallel functioning calendars, both for astronomical chains independent of a human and for the agricultural activity established by a human according to astronomical change and according to which rituals have been developed. To whatever phenomenon the rituals are confined to, protective preventive nature take place in every ritual complex. They manifested themselves and are still present in actions of participants in the ritual ceremonies and in the prayer addresses of the priest and they perceived more as a task of the organizer's priest and as a norm of behavior of each those of those present. For example, in the past, after sowing, sacrifices were carried out in order to prevent frost and cold winds. In one year, a brown fall was sacrificed, in another year, a black bull, and the animal was slaughtered, turning in 
it's heard to the Northwest. The informants explain this, that they worshipped to the North to avoid cold weather from the North. I will uh, give explanation for this case later. In other settlements, the ritual of dedicating to frost was performed. They sacrificed a gray sheep and prayed for the prevention and protecting of plants against frost. The next day, by the river, some priests went to sacrifice a duck to propitiate the spirit of the strong winds. So, in the spring of the first, uh, on the first day of pasture, domestic animals were purified, driving them through fire. Often, a similar event was held in the summer. Uh, protecting them from all kinds of diseases and epidemics. In the past, after the sprouting of cereals, there were often disasters with appearance of insects, various aphid pests that eat the cereals. In such cases, there were organized rituals of eradication of insects. In those rituals, only women participated. At present, such insect attacks are no longer observed in connection with the use of any chemical fertilizers. If gibby insects appeared in the field, then they organized the right gibby ulyan, expelling insects gibby. The women drove them out. Two women uh, uh, brought a bridle made from house hair and holding the bridle by both ends drove out insects from the field. They brought food to the field. A priest was chosen from the women of the village and they prayed for the kibi to leave the field. Or the insects were driven from the field by old women naked or half naked. Their hair was loose, brooms, reins, bells were in their hands. Then in a spring field, they cut a chicken, made a fire, boiled meat and prayed. Moving on, the, on to extreme periods and situations. First of all, one should point out natural and climatic cataclysms directly or indirectly associated with astronomical phenomena or, in the, or dependent on them. They directly affect the work activity of people and are very important both for an individual and for the entire community as a whole. For, for a peasant, one of the most important periods of the year is sowing, but for a successful harvest, uh, timely sprouting of the sown grain is necessary. If often happen, it, uh, it often happens that after sowing for a long time, there is no rain and drought sets in. In such cases, the right of calling rain out is carried out. The ceremony is carried out with the participants of mainly elderly women and children. Having agreed on the time and place of the meeting, they begin from the opposite to the cemetery, cemetery end of the village. Everyone goes to this side of the village with various vessels from which one can dose water. At the very beginning, the participants spray each other with water and uh, they begin the procession. They go into, the every ho into every house, they sprinkle everyone there. They pour in the yard, out buildings, windows, doors, gates, all household utensils and that get in the way. After completing the dozing in the village, everyone goes to the cemetery where they pour water on the graves of their deceased. Often in the village there are two, an old and a new cemeteries. In this case, they go to both cemeteries to those water. Designating the dead and the missing, they symbolically pour water from the ladle with the words, we pour 40 buckets. Then uh, they go down to the river, throw each other into the water, shake up the water. After such actions, a black ram is thrown into the river and the participants having washed go to their homes and chain into clean white festive clothes, gather in the field at the site of sacrifices. By this time, 10, 12 years old girls, it means before puberty, go around the village collecting cereals, eggs, buttermilk, 
from the collected products and the ram thrown into the water, meat and porridge are cooked. Usually prayer is performed by a river or a spring before sunset, uh, where all villages come. After praying and asking the God to send rain, everyone eats sacrificial porridge, meat. Uh, in the past, males did not take part uh, in this ceremony, only a priest and two assistants which sacrificed the animal. The sacrifice took place in a spring field locally at the cemetery. Black chicken is sacrificed, was sacrificed, meat and porridge are boiled in broth. A woman prayed, uh, asking for rain and good harvest. Sacrificial food is was eaten there. Women and children are involved. The bones are burned on the um, spot. After the meal, they organized running competitions for children. At the end of the ceremony, they reached a prayer of thanks. Again, those water each other with the words, just like we play with water, let it train the same way. At this ceremony, women are often the organizers and priests. If there is no rain even after the ceremony, then the whole procedure is repeated the next year. People found themselves in an extreme situation during the wars. Aged people remember well the events that took place during the Second World War. During this war, the great prayers by Jimbush were not organized. They were suspended, and there are no male priests left in the villages. Everyone was at the front. Epidemics uh, and mass uh, diseases uh, of both people and livestock did not pass by these places and regions. Also, they were not frequent. In addition to protective ceremonies, there were also ceremonies at the onset of the dis disasters themselves. Then they performed the rite of getting rid of disease and pestilence, driving out danger. The Ulet or Ulek rite was expelled during epidemics. All healthy and even able to move gathered in the opposite side of the village from the cemetery, dressed in fur coats and rags, turned inside out, tied old buckets, basins, uh, and uh, chased away evil spirits with metal tools. Every house knocked on all corners, under furniture, behind stove, and thus driving out the disease. They took it out of the field gate and escorted to the cemetery and buried there. Modern natural and epidemiolo epidemiological cataclysms have also strongly influenced the festive and ceremonial culture of the trans Kama Utmots. With the outbreak of a new coronavirus pandemic in the last year, the authorities prohibited mass public events. So, for example, it was forbidden to organize agricultural holidays, sabantui, blows, feasts. Uh, the last summer they were organized, but participants had to wear masks and comply with a number of other anti-epidemiological rules. It was also forbidden to conduct prayer sacrifices, but in many settlements they were nevertheless organized with participation of a minimum number of people. At the ritual place, the sacred groves, the leaders of the rituals, the so-called uh, pagan priests, and those who donated the, the sacrificial animals gathered together and performed all the necessary rituals. At the end of the ritual, they carried ritual porridge and meat to families in the houses. Uh, the last summer in Bashkiria and in the south of the Perm Krai, there was a strong heat and drought during the summer. This natural cataclysm actualized the ancient rite of making rain, what about was mentioned above, which became again very popular. In many villages, women and children walked dozing water on each other 
passes by buildings, visited cemeteries, ordinary and pledge the tears, where they poured water over the graves, asking that the tears for rain on the banks of water sources, they also poured water. After dosing water, prayers were traditionally performed. A black chicken was sacrificed in a special place not far from the cemetery. The ears were difficult when hunger raged. During such periods, no public rituals were performed. The most important were public commemoration days in spring and autumn. For a treat, the simplest foods were prepared so that it was something to remember the departed. So we have presented the most common rituals events in extreme periods among the trans Moors. The meaning of these rites is very clear and specific. Here are how people themselves explain some of the causes of such disasters. Firstly, one uh, of the main reasons for vi violation of natural and life cycles and onset of extreme situations was seen in violation of various taboos and religious rules. Visit to cemetery of, of mortgage, mortgage dead uh, in, uh, in a village of Kasiarova speaks about this. According to ethnographic data in the past, it was customary for different peoples to uh, dose water over the graves of the dead with an unnatural death during a drought. By this action, they tried to wash away their fields with water because it was believed that the desecration of the land by their corpses could cause a severe drought. Secondly, a uh, disrespectful attitude towards deities, for example, to the sacred grove loot could also lead to epidemics. Thus, Una Holmberg noted that cholera raged in the village of Mushga, of a province in 1910. The Utmurts believed that the cause of epidemic was the impermiss impermissible act of one of the villagers who, having killed his wife, hanged himself uh, in a tree in, in the sacred grove. To atone uh, for, this, for his guilt before the uh, spirit of Lord and stop the disease, the villagers dug his body out of the grave and buried it again. Thirdly, the local Udmurts escorted Uno Holmer himself out of the village because suddenly it started snowing and all the crops were covered with white snow. It was at the end of May. People considered that the reason for the troubles is the visits of a foreign guest to sacred places for no reason and in non-ritual times and without sacrifices. So, but we should pay attention to the ways to influence and achieve the goal in each case. Here, here there is a participation in such processes of otherworldly forces with the help of which the desired results are achieved. The use of water and water elements has both direct and symbolic meanings. The appeal to the deceased accompanying the procession to the cemetery and, uh, and ambiguously indicates the belief in help from the deceased ancestors. The expulsion of insects at night and even the performance of the ceremony at the cemetery or in the late afternoon are, are also directly related to the appeal to the other world or as well as the appeal to the north or west. Perhaps this explains the causes of disasters with the participation of otherworldly forces as well as their contribution and in getting rid of them. First of all, the help of ancestors who are able to support and help in all life situations. Another noticeable deviation from the old rules 
stands out if when praying at the cemetery, they turn to the God, which in the past was absolutely excluded. The prayer was carried out in the, in the border zone, precisely taking into account such a feature as the space of the departed, where there was no place to mention the gods, but only the spirits of the departed. There I'm is very sorry, clearly... excuse me. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Our time is limited. Yeah, I would like uh, to last, ask you. Yes. The last Mr. sentence. I know, I see. Yes. Very good. Thank there you very is much. clearly a lack of knowledge of the rules for performing these kind of rituals. In this regard, the real meaning and goals are mixed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the very exciting presentation. I was very interested to listen to it. And um, now questions are welcome. We have five minutes for questions. I'm sorry that I interrupted. No, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's Thank correct. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, your questions are welcome now. Oh, Tatiana, may I ask you a question? Uh, Thank you so much for your uh, thank you so much for your presentation and it's a real pleasure to see how preserved are Udmurtian um, customs and uh, ritual practices and so on. So the fact that in Russian traditions or different regions of Russia we see only in publications uh, mm -hmm. you see now all these yes. things. <laughs> it's great. Uh, but I understand that it is uh, another cultural system but Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I want to ask you, you uh, told about the, uh, the way um, uh, Udmurtian deals with epidemics, uh, cholera, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, do they do uh, something ritual uh, um, uh, with, uh, with this COVID epidemic? Some rip rituals that they... No, unfortunately, no, no any special rituals, uh, what is uh, um, connected for uh, so uh, to free from this epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, actually no, no. They did the usual calendar or another rituals, but not what is uh, really connected with uh, this COVID epidemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very it much. It is. It is. Thank you. This is very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> they should do it. <laughs> And the second one, uh, uh, we know that in Russian traditions, uh, there is also a tradition of dowsing with water if uh, there is a drought, serious drought. Yes. It can be either uh, timed to some festival or it can be an occasional festival. And my, uh, my question is, uh, do Russians of neighboring settlements with uh, Udmurtians uh, have uh, this uh, the same or close practices as Udmurtians. So uh, if uh, Udmurtians yes. preserve these actions until now and mm -hmm. uh, neighboring Russian population, do they preserve? Uh, 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 other, other population do not do it. But uh, the Udmurts, uh, Udvart, we, we are talking, uh, they are pagans, yes? This mm -hmm. group of Udmurts. And uh, it is allowed to uh, uh, organize this ritual. It is occasional ritual, of course, they, they, it, it will not be organized every year, if only there is very uh, mm -hmm. extremely drought like this year, the, the last summer. But it is forbidden to organize it after, after the summer uh, solstice, mm. and after all these ceremonies, water birth and the greenery birth and all these things, and about two weeks later, it is forbidden to organize this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. because it is too late, yeah, actually, to say yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> May I ask a question as well? No, Irina. Tatiana? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you uh, mentioned so many minor and major details of the ritual performances, which uh, in the whole construct the system of the Utmut uh, views on the world and nature. And uh, you mentioned honoring the North. If I understood yes, you correctly, yes, 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 yes. 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 Uh, are other sides also honored? Uh, 
like the east when the sun is rising or something mm -hmm. like that. It is known yes. in other cultural traditions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially yeah. the east. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Irina. Of course, all other ceremonies, all rituals, uh, they are uh, they are looking uh, forward the east or the, or the south. Only in this case, when it is uh, um, connected with death, uh, when they uh, uh, um, appeal to the death, it is connected with the west and with the north. So this is Thank you. this is very very concretely yes. If yes, it's so fascinating. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you very much for the questions and thank you again, Tatiana, for a very thank interesting you. presentation. Thank I you. was excited to listen to all <laughs> thank this you. very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. And it's time to invite um, the another presenter. Um, so uh, Nadezhda Pazuhina is welcome with the paper Confession of Faith in the Everyday Cultural Practice of Latvian Old Believers. Religiosity in Soviet period. Nadezhda, you are welcome. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm glad to, to see and to hear you. Uh, I apologize one more uh, time that uh, today I am so in, in radio mood <laughs> because my, my camera in, in, in my, my computer is broken. But um, I, I hope it doesn't matter <laughs> to, to hear me and to see my present also so I try to share my screen now um, so just a minute uh, do you see my screen uh, now um, so uh, it is visible my, uh, my, my presentation is visible now yes we can yes. see it okay yeah thank you um, so um, um, thank you uh, for um, presentation of my uh, of my title, and uh, uh, I am very uh, glad, and it is really a pleasure for me to participate in this conference. Thank you for invitation, and um, I would like to share um, actually some ideas and some preliminary conclusions um, about uh, uh, a part uh, of, of, uh, of a large um, research. Uh, it is a pro project, a research project of um, the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology uh, at the University of Latvia about religiosity in, in Soviet times. And um, so this pro project is, uh, is, is now um, uh, maybe the first <laughs> place for me, but um, uh, I would like to uh, to share some observations and uh, maybe some uh, reflections uh, on on this uh, topic and uh, on the theme. So first of all, um, uh, my aim um, would be to uh, to to show um, the experience the experience of everyday religiosity um, um, among old believers in Latvia during uh, the, Soviet, uh, the Soviet period. Um, and um, I, uh, I will base on the uh, oral, um, or, yeah, or, or oral life stories. And, and I, um, I would like to, to, to say that um, actually uh, this topic could have both um, aspects. So institutional one uh, of them is institutional aspect, and uh, if uh, um, if I record it um, uh, in the interviews with um, uh, clergymen, uh, so uh, clergymen, so um, for example, Nastavnik, so um, uh, so I um, always um, um, note uh, this institutional uh, or structural. Um, aspect um, uh, of collaboration or compromise with, with the Soviet system. But uh, for today, it is not the main thing for me. Uh, however, uh, I, I will draw also this context. And um, uh, the second point uh, will be this context and uh, 
my attempt to contextualize uh, the um, religious experience of, of the old believers in um, Soviet reality. Um, it, uh, I think uh, it is quite um, uh, important to, to understand also uh, the sources because um, um, yeah, this my um, this my uh, report, uh, this my presentation, uh, more is connected to this historical perspective, and um, I used uh, already reported um, life stories. Part of um, uh, the stories uh, were recorded already in um, uh, so for in. in 2008, uh, 2010, or, or uh, 2012, and it is uh, of course um, so some so some uh, time um, uh, distance yeah to to to, to this uh, moment yeah of um, uh, recording uh, and some um, interviews I uh, recorded um, um, in 2016 and 2018. Uh, so uh, uh, relatively uh, recently, and uh, actually, uh, I would uh, I, I tried to um, uh, to emphasize um, these moments of articulation of uh, everyday religious experience, uh, and uh, um, why it is uh, um, uh, it is significant in, in case of, uh, of the old believers. The everyday religiosity uh, for the old believers, of course, is uh, uh, one of main features uh, uh, that characterize uh, collective identity of old believers. And um, uh, historical uh, experience of the old believers uh, in general, but so also in um, particularly yeah, in, in Latvia, is uh, um, uh, so maintaining of tradition uh, in secret, <laughs> so in underground um, until uh, 95, uh, um, the old believers uh, were actually um, so um, really uh, a religious group for, uh, uh, of outsiders. <laughs> Um, but um, it is very um, significant, significant also that the uh, experience of social life um, uh, of this group in Latvia, uh, for example, in uh, interwar period, so um, in, uh, uh, was very um, was very different um, if you compare this previous period, and the old believers uh, were uh, very active not only in social life but also in political life and um, this attempt to build um, to construct uh, the new attitudes um, and uh, i don't know the new connections maybe uh, between uh, uh, religious group and um, um, inst state institutions uh, was so important that also during the soviet time part of old believers tried to um, to use this experience. So, and it is uh, a little bit controversial um, aspect, I, um, uh, I think, um, if we uh, analyze uh, the status and um, uh, actually conditions yeah, uh, for, for this religious group uh, during the Soviet, <coughs> Soviet period. And one, <coughs> uh, one specific feature um, of, uh, um, of the part of this interview, uh, um, recorded interview, is uh, that um, the interviews were recorded by, uh, by the students. So by, um, by the students of the history, of course, so um, uh, he, uh, professional <laughs> um, uh, inter interviewed uh, interviews, but um, uh, of course the um, differences, yeah, this distance, age distance between uh, the students, the young generation, and the old generation, so generation of their grandparents. Um, the distance uh, was uh, quite um, important and quite yeah, quite long. And sometimes uh, speaking about the uh, 
it's especially speaking about the Soviet past, um, uh, we can observe these omissions, yeah, also uh, some um, explications of, um, of, of, of their experience that um, is, is very useful for, um, for articulation yeah, of this um, experience, everyday experience that we uh, cannot uh, so observe in, in another way. <laughs> but yeah, these submissions, um, uh, I think, uh, are connected even with, uh, <clears throat> with this attempt <clears throat> to, um, to speak more about uh, uh, significant things and uh, not about something <clears throat> that was dramatical. And <clears throat> to explain uh, uh, a little bit about the uh, um, geographical location of um, uh, set settlement and for, uh, of yeah, these communities, parishes of all the rivers in Latvia, um, very short, uh, uh, I would like to say that the uh, Latgale, the east part of uh, Latvia, um, historically uh, was the main place uh, where um, the um, old believers, the orthodox old believers uh, lived. And um, uh, so if you speak um, about confessional um, particularities um, uh, in Latvia, historically uh, we have a priestly denomination and uh, only last 13 years we um, uh, we receive also new um, uh, phenomena of um, um, also um, uh, not one parish with priest um, of the rivers, but it is not so typical for, for our uh, region. And uh, most, the so majority um, of uh, all the leaders are Pomorians. Um, historically, also Fedesavians uh, or Old Pomorians, but today uh, is preserved only one parish, a small parish, but also in Latvia. And um, uh, uh, speaking about the Soviet period, so, uh, this statistical uh, data that you see on this slide actually. Um, uh, are very similar to the Soviet period, it, and it is also uh, specific of um, uh, Latgale and also you know, of, of Latvia in general. Uh, that um, um, uh, during the Soviet period, practically um, um, almost all um, old believers' parishes uh, were alive. Yeah, uh, in spite of. Um, uh, policy policy uh, towards uh, religion and anti-religious propaganda and uh, all, all limitations and restrictions uh, that uh, um, we, we know uh, in, <clears throat> in the context of uh, the Soviet, um, uh, so, 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 so Soviet regime. Uh, historical, <clears throat> historically, I would like uh, on, only very brief here yeah, to show some, um, some points, some, some moments uh, that uh, um, we observe also in this oral, um, uh, oral histories. So um, speaking or asking yeah, about Soviet period, for the um, respondents always uh, we note two periods. Yeah? The first uh, Soviet period, so um, 1914 and uh, occupation and annexion of Latvia. And uh, second time, so yeah, uh, so after the uh, after the war, and uh, um, uh, the res uh, respondents uh, are sometimes uh, also asked, yeah. Um, um, so do, do we speak about the first um, Soviet time or uh, Russian time, yeah, or we speak uh, about uh, about the so Soviet time? Yeah? So after after the war. And uh, uh, this traumatical um, points, yeah, the traumatical um, uh, events uh, are very similar to the um, other um, population group, uh, uh, also religious group in, in Latvia. And <clears throat> we can speak here uh, about the mass deportation, yeah, 1941, and about uh, deportation. So, uh, and uh, it was so politically uh, grounded deportation, so so-called anti-Soviet elements. And uh, the second deportation, uh, also mass deportation, um, uh, already after the Second World War, uh, 1949, 
so of uh, the deportation of rural uh, residents. And actually, uh, this deportation um, uh, was connected with collectivization. And uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the old believers uh, in Latvia so tra uh, traditionally, so historically, uh, were uh, mostly peasants. And also during the um, interwar period, uh, actually mostly um, uh, they were uh, even uh, even rural inhabitants, yeah, so peasants. And um, uh, as you see in this um, quotation, as a fragment from, from the conversation, uh, actually uh, also the old believer groups um, uh, they are involved yeah, in, in this tragical. Uh, events and it is very interesting that uh, um, so in uh, in memories yeah these um, events uh, uh, still um, are quite uh, so yeah it's still um, we remember it uh, uh, even as dramatical uh, effects but um, uh, I would like also uh, also note that. Uh, um, uh, there is also uh, another trend, and um, um, so in conversation about co-hosts, yeah, in uh, conversation about uh, collectivization, very often uh, it is um, you know, so attempt to neutralize you know, this uh, tragical or dramatical elements, yeah, and um, it is also a story about, uh, yeah. Uh, about the situation, so so, so it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we, we 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 didn't change anything. And uh, in in this interview, for example, um, we can feel um, this uh, um, very emotional attitude yeah, to the organization, but um, at the same time, also um, the idea of um, yeah uh, of unchangeable. Uh, conditions, so, so it was, and uh, for um, uh, many uh, co-hosts, yeah, many this uh, collect, uh, collective farms, yeah, uh, in Latvia is typical that uh, in um, so basis, yeah, in ground uh, of uh, this co-host, we are one uh, village, yeah, for example, one uh, uh, old uh, village, yeah, and. So, uh, in, in this sense, uh, we can speak also about uh, the continuation yeah, of uh, community, of also existing yeah, of this community, and maybe uh, in some cases it was a um, so less dramatic experience. Um, and so, uh, uh, speaking about historical context, also, um, of course, uh, anti religious uh, campaign um, uh, that um, uh, influenced not so. Um, um, concrete, concrete uh, the uh, parishes, yeah, or uh, the old uh, generation of old believers, but in general, influence the uh, education system, for example, <clears throat> and so called new uh, Soviet rituals. And um, uh, the mostly, um, as, 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 as uh, we can observe yeah, in, in these uh, life stories. Uh, mostly, uh, the impact of this anti-religious propaganda, um, as a result, yeah, also uh, was the distance, the um, significant distance between the private life and life, um, and ritual life, of course, traditional life of the family. Uh, so, internal, yeah, this uh, um, world yeah, of of tradition and external world. So, um, a life of uh, uh, yeah, social reality, uh, working place, yeah, and so public, yeah, public uh, area. Uh, uh, I should say that uh, for uh, the old believers' experience, it is not a new situation because um, of their um, even historical experience. So before uh, legitimization of this world, well, they all had yeah, this experience of um, underground life. Uh, but uh, yeah, this last uh, point here um, about uh, uh, Lithuanian um, 
situation, yeah, the Supreme uh, Council of the Old Believers in Lithuania, uh, it was the only official uh, centralized organization in the Soviet Union. And um, partly uh, thanks to this organized organization, the Old Believers in Soviet Union and particularly uh, in, La in uh, Lithuania and Latvia uh, could uh, uh, feel uh, this co collective identity also in a uh, visible way, in institutional way, for example. Uh, so uh, this um, uh, old believers, George Kalanda, uh, uh, was published during all the um, Soviet time and also to today. <laughs> but uh, uh, this uh, item is uh, this, uh, this calendar is continuation of the um, uh, interwar uh, calendar uh, of the interwar period. So, and uh, um, now I would like to show some uh, examples uh, from the interviews for, from, from this oral, um, uh, oral life histories about some um, yeah, some features that we, uh, that we can I'm see. very sorry. I have to interrupt again. Our time is limited. I would like ask you, ask you to make a final uh, or a summarizing notes. So we okay. have time at least four minutes for questions. Oh, okay. yeah. So please, your uh, short summary. Yeah. And so we have at least four minutes for questions. I, yeah, I, maybe I, I had a long time in my, yeah, in my computer. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, speaking about um, main features yes, that we have uh, in this example, uh, one of them um, for me uh, is observation about neutralization, about uh, neutralization of description of uh, this everyday um, religious experience, um, speaking about restrictions and limitations. Um, uh, during Soviet period, and um, uh, very um, um, very important um, border uh, between um, private life and uh, this space of uh, ancestors, and actually um, uh, also um, speaking on the tradition. Um, so as a remark, yeah, that this tradition always uh, is important and always is on the first place because of the uh, ancestors' experience. And uh, this escaping in the ancestors' words uh, actually could be uh, this platform for preservation, for maintaining of the life tradition during Soviet period, the period when uh, the rule of parish um, uh, was uh, less uh, so significant or less important, uh, even because of uh, limitation and restrictions um, uh, from the side of official um, uh, of official um, institutions. Um, so it uh, it is um, yeah the main uh, the main conclusions of this. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Now, questions are welcome. <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. Oh, oh, there is a question in chat. I will stop. Yes, um, so there is one written question. Did the old believers of Latvia maintain contacts with the old believers of Lithuania and Belarus during the after the Soviet period, during and after the Soviet period? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, um, uh, for sure. And uh, it was uh, um, practically the uh, only uh, one important uh, possibility to preserve also uh, this unity yeah, and uh, uh, context between the old believers and uh, this context was uh, very um, <clears throat> very active uh, active and very intensive and actually calendar that they um, um, uh, that, that they already already about it, uh, I already told, uh, told uh, this calendar was published uh, even thanks uh, the Lithuanian council uh, uh, the central council 
uh, as it was uh, not only Colombo, but actually it is um, a journal yeah, with, um, uh, with uh, publications about the history of all three rivers. Yeah? So uh, it was a um, very important source yeah, for the, for the rivers. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yes, please. When one more minute, we can use for questions. I guess. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Nadezhda, for your uh, very interesting presentations. Presentation. I, I want. I would like to ask. You told that in official space, uh, there were uh, not so many visible uh, old believer practices, so to say. But I would like to ask. Uh, we know that old believers have very ritualized uh, everyday life. Uh, for example, uh, they. The custom, the custom, the uh, the practice uh, to cross themselves uh, in the beginning of the day and uh, read prayers in the beginning at, at the end of the day before taking food, before having food, and so on, to light the candle before icons in their houses. Uh, do Latvian uh, old believers maintain these indoor practices in Soviet times? Did uh, did they maintain it? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, um, uh, you see, uh, so uh, my answer is yes, uh, but uh, all these visible customs, uh, even yeah, in gesture, yeah, uh, visible customs, uh, we are transferred into um, so how, um, internal world, yeah, so no, uh, of course not in public uh, life, for example, uh, for example, in the school, yeah, uh, or however, Part of uh, old believers um, told that uh, they never um, uh, was uh, uh, never uh, were uh, pioneers, for example, yeah, or uh, komsomolets, yeah, in, in, so they participated in, in komsomol, uh, never, but, but even in pioneer, pioneer yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's very very interesting, yeah, and uh, it uh, it was accessible somewhere, yeah. But maybe um, uh, they are uh, thought about situation in very small villages, and uh, so this uh, control, yeah, um, ideological control, uh, was more um, so it was stronger, yeah, uh, rather in, in the cities, yeah, but not so in small villages. Uh, but um, uh, yes, this um, uh, everyday uh, well, um, vi visible customs. Uh, are preserved, and so today, for example, if I see uh, one old believer, and it is uh, yeah, for, um, all of the generation of old believers now, um, yeah, they do all these customs also in, in public schools. Yeah, but uh, nowadays, of course, it is more sign of belonging, yeah, of identity. Thank you very much. Our time is over. We're really running fast. Thank you for the presentation very much again and for your questions. Well, that's my wife's computer. She has the best as it should be. Welcome everybody to the last session. Uh, I, I was a researcher on ritual. Uh, I'm now retired. Is Akfile present for her presentation? I don't see her. You are there, okay. <laughs> Please take the floor and present your talk. <clears throat> Hello, thank you very much again. Hello again. I will share my screen. I hope it will go smoothly. So my, my paper focuses on uh, mixed marriages during the Soviet period in Lithuania. Uh, in the years 19 and 54, until Lithuania became independent uh, in 19 and 90. Uh, so the geopolitical borders of the Soviet Union limited Soviet citizens' movement outside the Iron Curtain. The Supreme Soviet Council took over marriage control and regulations by establishing civil marriage and repudiating legacy of the church wedlock in the year 1940. The Soviet's politics concerning marriage was aiming at developing Soviet families' ideology in Lithuania. The civil marriage law was supplemented with new ordinance forbidding marriage to a foreigner in the year 1947. The ban was canceled in seven years, 
but marriages to foreigners ought to be registered in the territory of Soviet Union. The propaganda was used to form the right and wrong perceptions of the proper marriage. The proper motives for marriage were supposed to ensure certain characteristics of the Soviet marriage. <clears throat> the communist ideology was implemented in the totalitarian family politics in the Soviet Lithuania since 1954 till 1990. The case research revealed some latent aspects of the sociocultural life of mixed Lithuanian foreigners' families during the Soviet period of Lithuania. The social aspects were affected by the political and ideological measures of that time. So another side, yes. So the the measures were moving and migration restrictions, legal regulations and limitations of residing in the Soviet Union or studying at the university, universities of Soviet countries, employment obligations, and finally, civil safety. The stories referred to the strict control and restrictions executed by the political borders uh, bodies and the National Security Committee, KGB, concerning mixed couples migration on the Soviet borders abroad or back. The Soviet geopolitical borders with control and regulations affected mixed couples social and marital life significantly. The number of mixed marriages, however, managed to breach the Soviet border and develop more or less intensive transnational lives. So here I would like to approach two cases, two family cases I have interviewed and researched more deeply about their experiences and um, their mixed families, uh, uh, transnational connections to, to the homeland of the woman, the Lithuanian woman, and the uh, land of husband and the husband's um, place of residence abroad. So, uh, however, a number of mixed marriages between Lithuanians and citizens of non-Soviet countries did happen before the independence of Lithuania from the Soviets in the year 1990. Although it was not prohibited legitimately to marry a citizen from countries outside the Soviet Union, these cases we are very rare because of very limited contacts to other nationals. At the same time, there was various unofficial sub subsequence or restrictions that followed mixed couple and their family's private life. The consequences could have an effect on the family's living environment and residence, employment conditions and limitations in terms of possible career development relations or contacts with relatives or even freedom. The case described in a journalistic article would depict the Soviet real reality on how the marriage to a foreigner could affect Lithuanian people's lives. It corresponded to disloyalty of homeland still in the year 1986. As a woman interviewee noticed, parents were afraid of troubles at their jobs, I was interrogated by the agents of KGB and lost an opportunity to enter postgraduate studies even if my graduation from the university results were excellent because of her uh, mixed marriage and relations to a foreigner. So she interprets that. So I approached the topic by making case research in the year 2017. It took two interviews, I took two interviews from the members of two mixed families that involved Lithuanian and non-Soviet citizens. The picture of these stories was supplemented with the journalistic interviews with the same individuals, which were published in Lithuanian media. I also included some abstracts from monographs published by the interviewees, which referred to their life experiences. Uh, one marriage took place in the, uh, the uh, marriage play, took place in 1984 and another one in 1989. The interviews revealed some latent aspects of um, 
of sociocultural life of the cases. Um, so in both cases, uh, Lithuanians met their future foreign spouses in the Soviet educational institutions, where they studied linguistics or social scientists. As Soviet citizens, Lithuanian youth was not able to enter universities outside the USSR. Still, there was a possibility for foreigners to take some courses in the Soviet high schools when particular institutions had certain agreements of cooperation and exchange. As the Italian informant remembered, it was almost impossible to come to Lithuanian universities because of the communist regime. The tourist visa could be issued only for five days. He had some hope to visit Lithuania after exchange program was established between Italian and USSR academies of scientists. Only honored Soviet scholars would be sent to Italy from the Rus Russian institutions, however, honored Italian scholars did not wish to go to the Soviet academies. So there were some places for the younger students. What, thus, young graduate from the University of Bologna was persistently asked to come to, uh, to Russian schools, although he had scholarly interest in the Lithuanian language. Finally, the young linguist managed to collect agreements and permits required for a visit of eight months duration, which took him almost a year in order he could come to Lithuanian University. It could happen only because of his supervisor's eminent name internationally and friendly connections with the honored Soviet scholars. Informant was the first Italian linguist who managed to step into the Soviet Vilnius in the year 1975. Still, he was not permitted to leave the Vilnius city. Researcher experienced being spied and controlled. This made him realize the, the power of the Iron cur Curtain, which brought some fears and uncertainty. The warm feelings and love experience for a Lithuanian girl were followed by the uncertainty if there was a chance for the relationship to last. Another case, the Lithuanian interviewee's future uh, Cyprian husband arrived to St. Petersburg University to study journalism. His appointment was made by the organization Chart, even though he wished to stay in Moscow. According to the woman, to the Lithuanian woman he married, he could stay in St. Petersburg with the student visa as long as his studies lasted and he had to leave afterwards. The people's position was planned from above in the Soviet system because of the legal restrictions of residence and migration, as well as appointments for study or work. These rules were based on certain ideological and political measures, which had to be considered. According to the interviewee, uh, foreigners had limited freedom they could leave from the city of studies in a range of 80 kilometers, otherwise they needed a special permit. However, students could obtain the paper needed without big effort, considering the era of deficit, swap and bribes. The couple had to separate after the Cyprian man studies were over because his permit expired and he ought to leave from uh, St. Petersburg. The Lithuanian woman had to come back to her own country in order to take a job for a certain period, which was appointed by the compulsory employment system. So it was another uh, couple's case when a Lithuanian met a Cyprian man in the University of St. Petersburg, but after the studies and uh, visa uh, expiration of visa, the couple had to separate. The couples under focus had to separate after finishing their studies at the Soviet universities because of migration regulations and bans for foreigners to reside perpetually in the Soviet states. According to the informant, she and the Cyprian guy managed to meet few times in the Russian cities after he intentionally 
became a guide in the Soviet travel organization in Tourist. He was guiding groups of tourists from the Soviet countries friendly to Soviets, like Czechoslovakia in that time, Greece, USA, and visited Soviet Union for a few times in a year. These trips to USSR were the only opportunities for the couple to meet. Still, the both mixed couples' relations lasted because of frequent correspondence by mail, by paper mail, until they became, came to the decision to marry. The Soviet citizen could pay a visit abroad if he could receive a formal invitation from a foreign citizen. However, even this fact did not guarantee that Soviet authorities would give a visa permit to cross the Soviet border. The interviewee used this opportunity successfully and received a permit to visit Cyprus for one month in the year 1989. She noticed it was an absurd journey through all the Soviet instances of migration and complicated trip arrangements, which took her a year to complete. She realized at the time that probably it was the only one opportunity to see her beloved one because she could hardly arrive to Cyprus for the second time. This circumstance helped the mixed couple to come to the decision and register the civil marriage in Cyprus, which became legitimate act just in the same year. In the other mixed couples case, the future <clears throat> Italian's wife application for visa was rejected and she was not granted a permit to visit Italy, where her beloved one lived. The informant, the Italian man, was considering that the fact of his wife's birthplace in Siberia in the family of deportees was the cause of the political negativism in that time. As simply she could not arrive to Italy, she was not granted a permit to, um, to come to Italy uh, because she was born in Siberia uh, in the family of deportees. Considering the circumstances, uh, the Italian man decided to come back to Lithuania and arrange civil marriage with the young woman in Vilnius. Still, even the fact of civil marriage to a foreigner was not a sufficient reason for granting permits to cross the Soviet border out or back for an unlimited period. As it was mentioned by the informant Italian man, he came to Vilnius to marry his beloved one with the tourist visa granted for five days with mandatory appointment of sojourning in a hotel. I mean, he, he had to stay in the hotel. Even if the Lithuanian future parents-in-law wish, wished to make a festive wedding dinner in their house, in their private house, as it was for their elder's daughter wedding, it was impossible. They had to dine out. After the marriage, Italian man could not take his wife with him abroad as long as her official permits were not arranged and he had to depart alone. His wife arrived in Italy only after all the bureaucratic measures were arranged, which took some months to complete. As it was shared in the journalistic interview, the day of the Lithuanian's uh, departure to Italy was alike to the funeral day for her nearest family. Italian's wife realized that she would be hardly permitted to visit her Lithuanian family in the native land also because of her past. She was a child of the family with the mark of deportations. The following efforts to do so proved that she was treated as a foreigner by Soviet officials and she had to obtain all needed foreigners documentation in order to visit her native country, native family back in Lithuania. The visit was possible only after she received sister's formal invitation and wrote application asking for a mercy to pay a visit back in Lithuania. The permit was issued only for five days without a right to sleep over at her family's residence. Still, she did so. 
The longer visits to Lithuania could be hardly arranged until Lithuania declared independence from the Soviet Union in the year 1990. Italian's, uh, Italian man's wife had to find an approvable reason in order to be able to stay in the Soviet native country for a longer period of time. She got an offer to publish a book about Lithuania and therefore she could come and stay for one month in Lithuania. As she recalled in the interview, the agents checked on her all the time. Once she visited she was visited by a man in a suit holding a red rose and told to write the proper book if she wanted to visit her natives in the future. So her scientific work has to be proper for the, for the system in that time so she could be allowed, she could be granted permits to come back and visit her native family. These two main cases of mixed marriage illustrated how the Soviet political system and its regime could limit people's social lives, affect their relations and families. All the transnational channels to the outside world were very limited or cut. As the informant noticed, the relationship between the Soviet and foreign citizens were supposed to be impossible. According the communist ideology, the Soviet man could have relations only, could not have relations with the foreign man. The Soviet man should have relations only with the Soviet man. The interview mentioned that she would be hiding her relationship and keeping it in secret. She did not tell to anyone, even after her marriage and plans uh, to emigrate were arranged because of self-instinct and self-prevention instinct made her hide facts from colleagues and acquaintances. Akfile? Yes? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have two more minutes in official time. Please I will be done. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So only the closest family and friends would know the situation after she left the job. Although she did not face any particular acts from the KGB referring to her connections to a foreign citizen, she believed that taking lo talking loud about the mixed relationship could cause problems at the university on work. So conclusion, in this way, the silent, <clears throat> in this way, the silent mixed marriages managed to breach the iron Soviet border and develop family life while building new transnational connections. However, the mixed families transnational connections and flows to the foreign partners country were highly limited due to the Soviet policy and restrictions. Thank you very much. Yeah, in time, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very good, very good. These are very sad stories. <clears throat> um, um, Please uh, give the floor to questions if they, uh, there are any. Yes, please. My question would be, what, what do you think is the ethnological aspect of these lives? Uh, it is, uh, is there a, 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 the mix between Oh, loyalty and, and, and opposition or something like that in their life stories, or is it just uh, suffering? How could you generalize a bit about it? I think these stories, how uh, young people, they, they thrive, they put all the effort um, to keep their relationship. It's, it's beautiful how, how the system, it depicts how the system really um, puts you in limits and uh, puts you the, the in problematic situation if you wish to, to keep and maintain your um, feelings, your relationship and create a family uh, based on your feelings and emotions and love. So it's like the system against your personal uh, love and, and feelings and emotions. Yes. Um, yeah. But, um, and it also shows because I'm interested in transnationalism and how mixed 
mixed families <clears throat> uh, deal and um, lead their transnational lives after Lithuanian independence after 1990s. So considering the context of European Union, the mixed families in European Union, when there is freedom of movement, freedom mm -hmm. of migration, freedom of communication with your native and uh, your, uh, let's say, marriage family. And uh, so these couples were in completely opposite context. Yes. When the system put all the limits and restrictions for these transnational connections to happen. I mean, you could choose your, basically you had to choose, are you with your native family having this relationship and life? or you have to choose uh, the loved one. And, yes. and if you emigrate, you probably would uh, limit your uh, native connections very high degree. Yeah, yeah. I think these personal stories are very important uh, to, to, to get this, uh, uh, to get an idea of these, these lives. Um, are there any other questions, please? I think, no, yes, Tatiana, please. Thank you so much. It is very interesting and uh, very clear problems <laughs> connected with many of my relatives and friends too. What is uh, the situation uh, today? Is uh, there, um, are there any restrictions or uh, some regulations uh, which do not allow to marry a to marry with, uh, uh, with uh, four couples from another countries or on ethnical level or religious level, <clears throat> something. If you have any uh, answer, please. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm mainly focused on the couples uh, within European Union. Uh, my, this limit of the focus was because um, here they can, um, enjoy, the, they use this opportunity and all this legacy of free migration and free communication and uh, free marital, uh, um, I mean, choices. So that's why I, I wanted to see this difference in, in mm -hmm. Soviet times and within the European Union. Uh, there are some um, restrictions if, um, um, I think it's like in all European Union members, if you want to marry someone outside of European Union. Mm -hmm. But uh, within European Union, it's really uh, now very simple arrangement. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to build, a, to, to register a family, register mm -hmm. a marriage. It's really yes. simple, simple um, act of uh, civil mm -hmm. marriage. About yes. the religion, if um, um, I, because I approach Catholic, Protestants, and um, Orthodox people, uh, Greek Orthodox people. So since uh, couple members share the same um, Catholic religion, there are no restrictions to marry as well. Mm -hmm. If Thank people share you. Catholic religion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Akvile. Thank you. And now the next speaker is uh, uh, Marianka. Uh, on Facebook, a topic that has been uh, very absent, I think, in the, these days, last, last day. Please take the floor, Marianka, and uh, have your speech. Thank you, colleagues. Hello, uh, colleagues. Thank you for the possibility to participate in the, this conference. Now the paper. The cyber culture by the notion of the anthropologist Arturo Escobar creates a new cultural order in which the social and cultural matrices are influenced by the technologies. According to Escobar, the cyber culture can be understood through the transformation of the range of the possibilities for the communicating, working and being. The new technologies of information and communication are very important, both in the conditions of the pandemic and social distance, and in the conditions of emigrations, emigration too. They generate new practices and discourses, facilitate communication with friends and relatives at home want. Social networks like Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and so on, connect millions of people over the world, entertain 
serve for significant causes. The applied methodology uh, in the text includes observations and analysis of publications in the Bulgarian Facebook group Multilingual Children. The research focus is on the language as an element of cultural identity. Sanki Gershke compares the technique of no included observation with the social practice of working. This technique is suitable for the communication analysis on the, of the Facebook groups. Applying it to research means that the research becomes member of the respective groups. Some words for the Facebook group multilingual children. The paper tracks language, early language learning in a family environment abroad based on posts in this Facebook group. The Bulgarian Facebook group Multilingual Children was created in 2017 for parents who lived ab live abroad and want to teach their children in Bulgarian. Most of the participants in group are Bulgarian migrants or as some of them call themselves expats. The group rarely includes inter-ethnic families live in Bulgaria and both share their experience in the early language training in their children and the methods used in this process. The group is informal. The participants are consolidated by similar interests, purposes and values. The group is visible and confidential. So every Facebook user can see the group, but the publications in it are available only to its members. The Facebook group includes more than 8,300 members, and it is conducted by administrators and moderators. The rules, rules in the group require writing in Bulgarian and using Cyrillic alphabet self-promotion, spam, and irrelevant links are not allowed. In 2019, a moderator published a survey in the group in which the participants feel in their place of residence, city, and country. The survey has an informative purpose to outline the geographical scope of the group. On the other hand, it is a prerequisite for a quick acquaintance and contacts between Bulgarian living in the same city or country. Those wishing to complete the survey outline the following picture. Group members live in the cities and towns throughout Europe, as in the USA, Canada, Mexico, and so on. The research of the survey show a wide geography geographical scope of the Facebook group. The participants inhabit all populated continents. Migration is a multi-generational process. For migrant children of the first and first point five generation, the Bulgarian language is native. For children's second generation immigrants, the language of the parents is no longer native, but mother tongue. The situation is even more complicated in mixed marriages, with children grow up in a bilingual, trilingual, and fourth lingual environment. The paper tracks early language learning in a family environment abroad based on posts of parents, relatives, teachers, speech therapists, children's writers. The family is the first institution in a child's life in which he, she rece receives language training. When the family live outside Bulgaria, or it is a result of interethnic marriage, the children as are taught early in more than one language. Early language training is especially important for the dev development of language skills in the conditions of migration. The children receive training in the language, language of the host country in various children's institutions and informal networks, nurseries, kindergartens, schools, friends, relatives of the local parent. Uh, 
For the maintenance of the Bulgarian language among the children with Bulgarian origin abroad, there are a number of Bulgarian schools which include early language training from four to seven years. Bulgarian kindergartens abroad are rarely organized. For example, two Bulgarian kindergartens operate in Chicago. Some Bulgarian schools abroad educate children aged between two and four years in their preschool groups informally. For children with Bulgarian origin born abroad, the initial Bulgarian language education takes place in the family. The Bulgarian Facebook group Multilingual Children was created to help parents with guidance of their children's language learning. The moderators of the group are also parents abroad, so comments of the issues discussed based on personal experience. Type of publications. Common in group are publications in which parents, mostly mothers, share that their children aged between two and five years raised in multilingual environment understand the language just of both parents, but they refuse to speak Bulgarian. The language of the host country is actively used and mastered, while use of the Bulgarian only in conversations with the mother, for example. The uncertainty is in its comments are the reason for the children to refrain for speaking it. The support in the comments come from parents with similar experience and remind, remind the perseverance of the parent to speak children in Bulgarian will be rewarded. Often multilingual children are allowed to speak Bulgarian during the summer vacation with relatives in Bulgaria. Parents seek in other publications, parents seek advice of when to introduce a third language in their children's education. Education. This is necessary when an interethnic family lives in a third country with a different official language. In the comments, there are opinions of linguists that both of language should be strengthened before the introduction of the third. Parents also share their experience in a four language environment. For example, Bulgarian mother and Italian father communicate with each other, uh, other in English. They live in Malta. The child, two years old, speaks Bulgarian with the mother, Italian with the father, and Maltese and English in the nursery because they are the official languages in Malta. This, thus, the four languages skills develop in parallel from an early age. This is so-called mixed bilingualism. In other publications, family, family living abroad, looking for Bulgarian children around the world with whom their children can correspond by mail. In this way, way the children, in addition to making friends and learning interesting facts about the life in the respective countries, they practice and master Bulgarian language in writing. And the fact that both of children live abroad and don't speak Bulgarian fluently spares their self-confidence in making spelling mistakes. Women share comic situation of mixing languages from their children who use code switching. The children use words from different language when they uh, don't remember or don't know the word in the language they use during the particular conversation. Scientists, scientists have proven that multilingual children are not confused when they, when uh, which language to speak. There, they learn languages more intuitively. It's possible to language skill, skills, speaking, listening, reading, writing, to be not equally 
well developed in multilingual children, and then one language becomes dominant. If intensive contact with the second language being before the age of three, this is uh, so-called mixed bilingualism, children learn it in the same way as the dominant language. Between the ages of three and 12, the second language is already learned differently. This is coordinated bilingualism and the process resemble than of learning a foreign language. According to another publication, parents are looking for Bulgarian fairy tales in English to read during the week of the book in their children's English school. Parents and Bulgarian teachers support each other by, by the sharing information on or links to Bulgarian education platforms in internet. And some words uh, in conclusion. The Facebook group Multilingual Children visualize the linguist aspect of intercultural communication. The ability for intercultural communication is a way to an effective personal development. The multilingual children develop parallel skills in reading, writing, listening, and speaking into two and more and more languages. The participants in the Facebook group are convinced of the need for the multi multilingual education of the children, not only to be able to communicate freely in the whole society at, and in the homeland of the parent or parents, but also to have broader prospects for professional realization in global world and to have a stable cultural identity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a fascinating uh, subject. I, I didn't know these uh, Facebook groups uh, existed. Um, um, it's also interesting that the parents are also part of a big network all, all over the world. Uh, uh, it is also interesting. Um, are there any questions from colleagues, please? Yes, I have one. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marianka, for your presentation. And I would like to ask, uh, uh, from the beginning of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic pandemic, uh, we saw many types of activities uh, moving online. And uh, uh, we see uh, from your presentation that um, people who are the part of this uh, Facebook group, they are uh, 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 very, um, they think very much about uh, the way uh, how to um, make their children know their uh, language of origin. Are there new possibilities uh, for online learning, uh, Bulgarian? Uh, possibly uh, do people, uh, do members of their group of uh, this Facebook group promote uh, online learning of Bulgarian in this group? Uh, no, um, the online education uh, is uh, the old uh, uh, idea of the um, Association of Bulgarian Schools Abroad. Uh, this is the idea before the um, beginning of the COVID pandemic. Mm. Uh, but um, this is this uh, um, Facebook group, uh, parents group is um, um, how to say more informal. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, doesn't um, um, propose uh, online education. It's uh, uh, only mediator between the schools, uh, the Bulgarian um, teachers abroad, and uh, uh, the. Uh, parents, uh, uh, migrants, and uh, their children. Thank you. I, I, I understand. Yes. I have a question. Yes, May please. I? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a very topical uh, theme, I suppose, because almost uh, everybody has uh, some connections in Europe or in the USA uh, with uh, uh, with uh, relatives and uh, 
I particularly have a grandson in Luxembourg with many languages. So being a grandmother, I, I'm wondering, I know from my experience in Bulgaria that usually grandparents have a, a very important role in preserving the language and the folklore of Bulgaria. Does this group uh, discuss the role on, of grandparents in keeping the Bulgarian language? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, the, um, the grandmother, uh, like, um, uh, how to say, a very important uh, person, very important person to keeping uh, Bulgarian language and, uh, and uh, traditions um, is present by the uh, by the narratives about these uh, uh, vacations in Bulgaria because uh, for example many Bulgarian uh, children uh, don't uh, want to speak English in the whole society but uh, when they uh, come in Bulgaria for summer vacation they communicate with their grandmothers their uh, cousins and other relatives and uh, uh, they uh, fast uh, um, start to communicate in Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the the role of the uh, grandmother is uh, implicit, but it is presented it in uh, its uh, Facebook uh, publications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, interesting aspect. Yes. Are there any questions to Marianka? If not, then I propose we go ahead, a bit ahead of uh, schedule. Uh, now it's the turn of uh, Ekaterina. Are you there? Yes. All right, yes, hello. Thank you, Thank you. hello. <laughs> hello. Nice to see you again. Yeah, yes, again. Uh, okay. Please take the, the floor, yes. Okay, I would like to ask my colleague and friend, Jusitis, to give <laughs> So yes, please wait a minute. Back my uh, PowerPoint uh, because uh, with uh, these technical problems, yeah, it's not sure that. If all is okay, the first slide. We don't see it. But Gilbert, uh, please. Oh, sorry, it might be. No, it doesn't work. What's the problem? I may try, but it was difficult from my side. Jelitis, now found 5 p.m. It's okay. Ah, it's yes. okay now. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I will ask you only to change it. But just a second, because I didn't see now me, my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, it is about celebrating Christmas and New Year with immigrant families in the United States. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, I had a good possibility to be in States uh, about New Year times and uh, to observe uh, really very interesting things there. About Christmas, it's, uh, you know, all over the world uh, uh, and uh, not only in Christian world, because uh, really uh, the, the idea is to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ, but in Islamic world and uh, Hinduistic world, uh, it's also very, very popular. And so the general question here, and there are a lot of works about that, uh, if it's about uh, Christmas, if it's about religion or faith or industry, and uh, uh, all things are uh, actually true. Uh, and we have, uh, but the Christmas is everywhere almost the same. Uh, it is the Christmas tree, Christmas nativity stand in the church, and uh, the parades and manifestations of Santa Claus, uh, snowflakes, beer, and uh, sure, Christmas table, 
with turkey, cookies, etc., and gifts. So why maybe the industry is uh, the right right uh, answer for this question? The next uh, slide, please. Mm -hmm. And so here is uh, New York City, Rockefeller Plaza, and here is Dubai and Emirate to this uh, big hotel. And all this uh, Christmas and New Year industry is absolutely popular. It, and it's not only about tourism. It's also very, very, uh, how to say, important uh, for the Arabs or the Muslims as well. Here it is India and they have kitchens there, uh, especially in Genoa and uh, in, the, in some cities. But uh, in uh, Delhi and uh, other cities, uh, Christmas is uh, absolutely popular and we see the same personalities and uh, typical uh, Indian dresses. And here is in uh, Arabi Saudi, Saudi Arabi, and uh, it is a big mall. And you see it's uh, absolutely comparable with, uh, to every ball uh, everywhere in Europe or in the uh, States, uh, absolutely the same. And uh, that's really very, very interesting uh, that it's uh, so, so popular. Next mm, slide, please. Uh, and uh, what is America's standards? Uh, by the way, it is interesting that uh, this tradition uh, with Christmas Eve, Christmas and the New Year uh, is not uh, so old in the United States. Uh, it is, uh, it becomes some, uh, how to say, citizen uh, social uh, piece from 1995. Uh, it is uh, 19th century and before uh, that was the period uh, it was forbidden peace. And uh, you see uh, that is uh, absolutely necessary to do if you live in uh, states. It's first it's uh, to have Christmas decoration in public uh, and in open private space. Uh, it's uh, in your yard. Uh, you have to decorate uh, your door. Uh, you have uh, lights and all this. And if you don't, uh, if you don't do that, uh, you, uh, you will be taxed. Uh, and so you have to do it. And uh, sure, traditional dishes uh, uh, for Americans is also enough, uh, uh, how to say, uh, regulated. It's turkey, gingerbread, pumpkin cake, cake or uh, apple cake, and uh, eggs with your, uh, uh, I think it was egg, no, something like that. And so it is a decoration and it is turkey with all these things. Okay, next slide, please. Um, oh, thank you. And what about mixed families? Because it's uh, completely different if you have one diaspora, like Greeks, for instance, or uh, you will have absolutely uh, other tradition. But in uh, dispersed mixed families, uh, you have a, a different situation. And so I, I uh, choose two cases. Uh, uh, very similar. Uh, the first one is with husband who is an uh, uh, half Russian, half Bulgarian, uh, and he's Christian Orthodox, and wife is Italian, Tunisian, and Christian but Catholic, uh, at religion. And the second case, the husband is uh, the same actually, and but uh, the wife is Latvian. Uh, a daughter of Latvian Russian marriage, and she's Christian as well. Uh, but actually, I think uh, that in uh, both cases, uh, we have uh, cases of the uh, atheism with the uh, official, official religiosity. Actually, they're atheists, but uh, there is uh, 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 a formality that is important, uh, especially in our cases. Next slide, please. Uh, slide. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, Italian case is really very, very interesting uh, because Italians, uh, first of all, there are a lot of uh, uh, United States, but uh, they uh, have a specific cuisine and uh, they keep uh, it. Uh, and uh, maybe the most uh, important and uh, with a lot of uh, 
symbolic sense, it's uh, the uh, Christmas lentil. Uh, it is uh, Giampone uh, and Cotecino. Giampone uh, is Giampon. Uh, in France, it is uh, pork meat uh, as uh, salami. And uh, this lentil, and we have a lot, a lot, a lot of little cones. And uh, the second one is Christmas cake, panettone. Uh, that is uh, the same uh, for Easter. Uh, but uh, it is with uh, another sense uh, here. And Christmas chocolate, uh, uh, it is uh, also very, very popular. Baci from Perugina. And uh, so it was absolutely mandatory for the uh, Christmas table, uh, actually the center of the rich, to be together, to be with the family uh, in this day. The next slide. <laughs> please, Julitis, uh, is with uh, this uh, Latvian Russian uh, couple, and uh, where well, it's really difficult to say what is uh, actually Latvian, uh, because the the first dish, uh, meat jelly, it is uh, popular not, not only uh, in Latvian's milieu, it is uh, traditional for uh, Russians too, and uh, for all Soviet Union, uh, and uh, it is so popular in cinema uh, and in books. Uh, it is really uh, something that maybe we can uh, name uh, um, Soviet, yeah, because it's really very, very popular. The next one is uh, so called Olivier Salat, or there are one other Salat, but it's uh, maybe the same. Uh, uh, it is with uh, this uh, jambon uh, and beans and uh, carrots, etc., and with uh, the sauce of mayonnaise. And it is uh, also mandatory for all Soviet region and uh, uh, socialists as well in uh, in Bulgaria. It, uh, this salad is called Ruski uh, salad, uh, Russian salad. And uh, it was interesting because in the Italian uh, case, uh, if uh, the restaurant and uh, visiting the restaurant exists, uh, but it's not uh, uh, ethnically tolerated. But here it is a Russian restaurant and uh, it's a very popular Russian restaurant, Whisky Samovar. And in the Christmas day, not in the Christmas Eve, uh, the restaurant uh, uh, has been uh, uh, was visited. And the next slide. And uh, we have here common elements because we have this Russian culture, uh, but uh, we have Italian elements uh, and uh, universal elements. Christ Christmas tree is absolutely uh, obligatory, mandatory thing here. Turkey or goose, uh, and uh, the, it is uh, uh, important that it, uh, the third is prepared from the householder. And uh, the second one, the third one is black and red caviar, that is also Russian phenomena, and it is uh, from thinking like Russian phenomena. And uh, the other interesting thing it is to visit its ballet around Christmas, and especially in the character of Tchaikovsky. And uh, this is uh, this uh, exists in both cases and differences. Uh, in this case one, it is a Italian, there are Italian dishes. And uh, in case two, Russian, Latvian, uh, because it is Russian and Latvian, and I can't say what is actually Latvian in all this. Uh, because uh, specific for Latvia is uh, beans uh, with pork, uh, but uh, it doesn't exist in, the, in this family. So it's meat jelly, olivia salad, uh, it is a New Year Russian dish, and seafood, uh, very popular in Latvia, uh, but in Russia as well. And all symbolic and semantic, we don't speak about that, but it's uh, really very popular. 
it's uh, sure all is connected with fertility, prosperity, richness, and love. And I love this uh, bachi with the Regina <laughs> because it's really very, very nice, like a symbol. And the next slide. And uh, so this is a uh, nutcracker, uh, and it is visited, uh, visited uh, every year uh, in Metropolitan and uh, with uh, the same pleasure every time. It's something like a sign of a Christmas, a Christmas tree in the house uh, and caviar as uh, something uh, really like looks because it's uh, uh, possible to buy in really good uh, quality in uh, Russian uh, in Russian uh, stores. It's the best. And the next slide, please, Julie, how much time I have. And the question is, what is about Bulgarian tradition? Uh, because Bulgarian tradition is uh, much more interesting than this uh, may be because. Uh, because there are a lot of elements uh, that are connected with Manti, to with future, and all that. Uh, and uh, something about uh, that it is uh, not odd number of dishes, uh, and there uh, with not meat, uh, it is obligatory. And uh, we have bread, beans, uh, banits, uh, cosmetic, that is really very, very interesting. Uh, uh, the a specialist in the in Kesmet. It is a traditional pie with uh, cheese and with lucky wishes. It's something like uh, in a Chinese restaurant that you have a little cookie with a, a small pepper inside with uh, some wish. And uh, it is in the pie and everyone uh, can find his uh, luck for the next year. It's a uh, home or love or family or something like, like that. Uh, and um, without meat, uh, sir, meat, sir, night is uh, something like Poivre uh, Lopez, uh, uh, but with uh, figures in, uh, at, uh, 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 with cabbage. It, it's a meat in cabbage, but it's only rice. For Christmas and uh, pepper uh, in the same manner we prepare nuts uh, uh, and sack foods uh, like the compact and uh, red wine and drakia brandy. So it's uh, enough rich and very typical for Bulgaria. It is very propagated and uh, every Bulgarian family do it. Uh, it's not so religious but uh, traditional to it. And the next slide. But it doesn't absolutely doesn't exist in this family with Bulgarian house. And uh, so, what can we do? It is really very very quickly because we have a lot of questions there. But uh, I will uh, speak uh, uh, about uh, two aspects of these cases. And uh, the first one is the big role of migration because in both cases we have a lot of uh, we have. Uh, as a minimum, uh, uh, two cases of, uh, uh, of mix. It's uh, the person, the schools in cases, their second generation of children of mixed migrant marriage. The husband is uh, from Soviet Union, Russian from Soviet Union, it is a mother, and uh, the father is uh, from Bulgaria. So he has this uh, mother, Russian, that is really very, very important here, but he lives now in the USA and it's more than a year. And uh, uh, first, the wife are more interesting <laughs> here, uh, because in the first case, wife uh, is from Italian-Arabian marriage, and it was uh, in Tunisia, uh, and the mother and grandfather, they're from Italy. And so this Italian tradition with all these Italian things came actually not directly from Italy. It came from Tunisia, where we have a big diaspora uh, of Italian Catholics. And uh, that's really very, very interesting uh, that uh, this uh, uh, dish 
with beans and pork is without pork. So in the family, and when I invite my uh, conversation with this woman, it was really very, very interesting. There were 10 child and half of them uh, were uh, boys and half girls. And girls, they were uh, Catholics as their mother and young um, mother. And boys, uh, Arab Muslim, like their father, but at the family, they respect all tradition, Christian and Islamic, but without pork. And so in this family, I saw a lot of different dishes, but never pork, because it is uh, uh, forbidden in uh, Islamic tradition. The second case is also uh, me, uh, the wife is from mixed uh, marriage, because her father was from Latvia, and uh, Madhu was Russian from Soviet Union. So it was a Soviet brand that uh, Akhil, I think uh, she spoke so interesting things about. And uh, she's half Latvian, half Russian in USA now. And uh, uh, <laughs> already knew, but it is interesting that Latvian tradition is not really very visible. And uh, it is really interesting, but it is. Uh, completely explain it's possible to explain of this Russian mother and uh, the life in Soviet Union with this uh, it's the same indication like in the uh, states the menu of uh, the Christmas Eve and the Christmas is uh, very very clear and uh, uh, what the other, or what is really uh, interesting, that is a um, question of uh, kinship, uh, finally. Because uh, uh, all this festive tradition and cuisine tradition and all that is maintained by women. It's not uh, a man that uh, made to say, I would like to see my Bulgarian cuisine in the Christmas Eve. It is the woman. Uh, this maternal line, Italian, Russian, with uh, grandmothers and all that, uh, that uh, determined uh, the situation in one family. And uh, it is interesting to what the husbands, this uh, Bulgarian, Russian person, okay. uh, actually uh, do in this. Uh, uh, in this situation, and it is, uh, of course, it is uh, the thing from high Russian culture, it's ballet, very, very typical for Russia and for all over Europe uh, in the 90s of 19th century. And after that, you know, you, you know that Metropolitan uh, was open from the conductor, uh, it was. Uh, Jokovicikovsky himself. So, <laughs> so why it is uh, so good in New York as well to, to hear and to see uh, Tchaikovsky ballet and caviar, very, very specific, okay, and seafood uh, that is really very popular, uh, but not only in uh, high Russian culture, actually, it is, it is a Marian cuisine, but it is so popular and healthy that we know that uh, without. To Mediterranean can we do? And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And plus, American culture. It is, and plus, uh, only it is with uh, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank yeah. Very tasty pictures. It looks yes, very delicious. Yes. <laughs> thanks for your attention and happy upcoming Christmas for everybody. <laughs> yeah, because the, the table is really uh, the most visible part <laughs> of yeah. the Christmas. Hello. Um, yes. Hello. 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 Yes. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I am very glad to participate in this conference and my topic on presentation is Lithuanian Kruptikas, generation of Lithuanian diaspora in US. I didn't dear drip uh, meat dripped over my beard. I didn't have in my mouth. That's how almost all Lithuanian tales end. 
Meat produced according to Lithuanian traditions was written about in the 16th century. According to historians, Lithuanian could drink uh, the fermented drink made from bee honey in the Mesolithic age. Beer spread among Lithuanians along with uh, agriculture and even later wine production began. In the territory of the Republic of both nations, uh, to which the Grand Duke of Lithuania belonged to new types of alcohol were firm, uh, formed after the invention of vodka, whereas bitters, liquor, starka, and kurupnikas. According to gastronomy historian Antanas Ostrauskas, there is not correct way to define how alcoholic beverages can be Lithuanian, which means that it's not possible to mean, name which beverages are indeed Lithuanian. Comparing the peculiarities of the producing process of alcohol, beverages made in Lithuania and outside Lithuania, it is more common that unique. Therefore, it is stated that the Lithuanianness of beverages is indigent through association with popular, but not always accurate images of the past in the wish or on other beverages emerges. Following this theoretical approach and focusing on the peculiarities of the preparation and using of the Lithuanian diaspora, I will examine the problem of the expression of this ethnic and national identity of American Lithuanians through food. In the paper, I will discuss in the following questions. What uh, is the origin of the Krupnikas making tradition in America? What is the significance of uh, this drink in the daily life and celebrations of Lithuanian diaspora? And whether and how Krupnika's production and using practices contribute to the maintenance of Lithuanian identity? Analyzing, uh, comparing, and summarizing the material collected during the interviews and the narratives of American periodicals about Krupnikas, I will seek to reveal the peculiarities of the preparation and using of the second wave of Lithuanian diaspora and its significance and in fostering Lithuanianness. Uh, the study was done by using a semi-structure interview during which with, uh, the respondents were discussed uh, Lithuanian food, daily festive food preparation and eating practices, and of course, Lithuanian identity. Uh, you can see more information about the respondents in this slide. It is worth uh, mentioning that due to the COVID pandemic, interviews with American Lithuanians took place by Zoom platform. This allowed me as a researcher not only to observe non-verbal language uh, of the respondents, but also to show the object they were talking about, for example, a bottle of uh, Krupnikas. Although the emergence of Krupnikas is associated with the Lithuanian, Lithuania in books presenting the country's traditional food and drinks uh, to foreign guests, such as Berute Imbrasenė Lithuanian traditional food or Lithuanian traditional meal, Ramuna Žukauskas Lithuanian food or Gordon McLachlan's Lithuania the Bread Travel Guide, mentions only beer and meat as Lithuanian drink. Uh, the online guide to traditional food taste atlas, uh, which features authentic recipes and articles of traditional ingredients and dishes from various countries, also point out that the traditional Lithuanian drink is meat. The website is providing information about Lithuania, Go Vilnius, uh, and uh, Lithuania travel, announce that beer, berry wine, and meat uh, are beverages that must be tasted when visiting Lithuania. So today's sources on the internet do not include the Krupnikas and the Shutrai list. The recipes for this noble drink are much more often found in the publication of Lithuanian culinary in America. For example, the recipes of Lithuanian Krupnikas are uh, published in the recipe books of Joanna Baltrushaitinė or Galina Mačiulytė Daugirdėnė. Also, uh, five different versions of Krupnikas are presented in Josefa Dožvartinė book, uh, Popular Lithuanian Recipes. That is, on, uh, in contrast uh, to Lithuania, in America, the preparation and using of Krupnikas is much more supported uh, by the Lithuanian diaspora. 
Official recipe state that the Krupnikas requires 98% alcohol, a lot of honey uh, and spices, such as cinnamon, vanilla, fos, shafran, nutmeg, and others. The, the proportions and the using of which can vary according to uh, the taste of the producer. According to Rimvedas Laujikas, a researcher of Lithuanian gastronomic culture, attempts uh, to delve deeper into the origins of this drink are more covered with legends uh, than marked by historical research. One of the most uh, popular legends states that Benedictine monks uh, in Nesvij, which belonged to the Grand Duke of Lithuania, created the Krupnik, uh, Krupnikas at the end of the 16th century. Due to the uh, common historical past, this drink can be found in Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland, and it was especially uh, popular in Lithuania in the 1920s and 1940s. In addition, although the origin of the Krupnikas most closely con connects uh, Lithuania with Poland, the Polish Krupnikas, according to American Lithuanian, is like our level drink that spoils the name. The Karim also produced the unique Krupnikas with a lot of spices and a drop of honey. Uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. The topic of Krupnikas should start with the name. In America, among Lithuanians and Americans who like this amber drink, there are even three names. Virta or Virtas, derived from the word Virte, it means boil, boilo and Krupnikas. Although not officially confirmed, uh, the drink is believed to have originated in Shulkil County, Pennsylvania, the largest Lithuanian community center in America during the first wave of Lithuanian migration. After working all day in the cold and wet coal mines, Lithuanian workers turned a small cup of warming drink after their shift, uh, which looked like Krupnikas with ingredients. Not having the necessary spices, but in order to have a small Lithuanian here, the drink was made from cheaper whisker for queens, ginger lemonade, some honey and spices. Migrants uh, of uh, another nationality, seeing Lithuanians boiling and tasting this drink, gave it its name Boilo, which is still actively used these days. Interestingly, Americans use uh, all three of the names of synonyms for this uh, same drink uh, with Lithuanians' roots. Meanwhile, Lithuanians clearly separate Krupnikas from Boilo. Boilo, name form of workers or coal miners, and the Lithuanian made Krupnikas reflects the Red Villa times. Sometimes Boilo is called a false Krupnikas. Meanwhile, there is now a consensus among Lithuanians about what is Virta. Some say uh, that the old Lithuanian coal miners called it a drink they made to replicate uh, Lithuanian Krupnikas. Others, that name Virta was used to name Krupnikas. Despite this slight conf uh, confusion, according to Italian professor Giuliana Elena Garzone, the preservation of eating habits and culinary tradition is a vital and effective anthropological tool for uh, preserving identity in the context of migration and a powerful tool for creating semiotic and communicative system. In exile, uh, the preparation of and using of Krupnikas is not associated with ordinary meetings of friends during which another glass of alcohol is poured, but with family celebrations and certain rituals. One of, the, uh, on, one of them is the great uh, winter's holiday when gifts are exchanged and ethnic food and drink is served. The American press reports about this time and the process taking place in Lithuanian cuisines. Every Christmas period, a kind of alchemy, alchemy takes place in Pennsylvania, where uh, skilled pra practitioners uh, scringing to large pot boils a strong but sweet elixir of secret res uh, recipes passed down from generation to generation. This is the time from Thanksgiving to New Year's 
in a frequent Lithuanian family is associated with the, uh, the aroma of a boiled Krupnikas, welcoming uh, new friends and relatives, delighting Lithuanians and foreigners with, uh, with Krupnikas a Christmas present. In addition, Krupnikas is also essential uh, in the weddings of Lithuanian diaspora. A small cup of this drink sometimes greets uh, the new leaves or in, uh, it is enjoy at midnight to wish uh, the long live years. Krupnikas is present as a thank you to the wedding guests of a new family. It is necessary to mention that this tradition is especially common at weddings for mixed couple. Uh, one of, of the spouses is Lithuanian and uh, much rarer when marrying only Lithuanians. The origin of such traditions is uh, reasoned by the need uh, to introduce Lithuanian culture to relatives and friends of the second half. According to 66 years old woman, we attract others to learn about Lithuania and to establish contact with uh, them through food, through drinks we can re uh, reach those people. It was such a pleasure. You know that you do something in Lithuania. Keep it. Share not only with your friends, but also with other outside Lithuania. By showing pride in this culinary heritage and giving it a strong symbolic meaning, Kupnikas becomes a drink not only uniting uni Lithuanians, but also distinguishing uh, them from other nations in the multicultural uh, American community. It can be said that Kupnikas acquires a new image in exile in order to show this root of origin, becoming a symbolic declaration of identity. Kruptikas is inseparable from the gatherings and celebration of the Lithuanian community. It is served at international dinners and at ethnic exhibitions representing American communities. It is inter interesting that uh, during this event, event Krupnikas preparation competition is organ organized. Krupnikas king or queens is elected. The organization of uh, such events allows us to assume that Lithuanians are not amateurs in the preparation of Krupnikas, but they have much more uh, knowledge and skills and value themselves uh, to the experts in this drink. In such competitions, the produce of making Krupnikas for a moment seems to lose uh, the meaning of um, maintaining Lithuanianness and becomes a kind of battlefield with the winners and losers. Not only the content, but also the form is important in the preparation of Krupnikas, the label that decorates the drink bottle. According to the of the respondents, a new preparation is a new story. Such stories can reveal a lot about the diaspora's self-perception, what you way of life. Each time Krupnikas is prepared, it is coded with the, uh, the name of producer using certain words, images, or symbols. It's like a message from Krupnikas producer to someone who will taste it later. Uh, the definition proposed by the social sciences need to be used to better understand uh, the information provided on the labels of Krupnikas. According to them, every labels uh, creating for Krupnikas can be considered a brand and analyzed based uh, of, on UK marketing professor Peter Doyle's concept that a brand is an exclusive label that defines who you are and the, what your values are. This definition, which is close to the concept of identity, allows us to assume that Lithuanian diaspora create Krupnikas labels that consciously or unconsciously influence the self-assessment of identity. And Lithuanian heraldry and uh, ethnic motifs uh, are used to decorate uh, the labels revealing the diaspora self-awareness and strengthening the Lithuanian origin of Krupnikas. For many years, uh, the Krupnikas was only made at home. Lithuanians who came to America after the Second World War prepared it symbolically, according to the respondents for uh, one bottle to celebrate Christmas. Uh, 
Over time, however, uh, the preparation volume of Krupnikas changed. The respondent I spoke to said that we had multiplied and made it in larger quantities and more often. And the children had increased uh, that uh, quantity a little more by using a large pot specifically for making about 30 bottles at a time. Although there was an increase in the production ambitions of Krupnikas. But as the start of industrial productions of Krupnikas in the USA, in the second decade in the uh, 21st century, Lithuanians diaspora are not particularly positive about taste, does not transmit the taste of honey and quality, including Krupnikas. Uh, this aspect reflects the transformation um, process of industrially affect Krupnikas produce, um, production. According to the respondents, the production of large quantities of Krupnikas takes away personality as the preparation of Krupnikas is a very small bag. Uh, the unfavorable approach to the industrial production of Krupnikas conceals a much uh, deeper meaning than the decorated taste and quality. A Frankfurt Krupnikas producer of this time has taken the recipe of, from the, his parent or grandparent who is generally considered basic and correct. Resisting against, against it, each uh, producer uh, creates his own secret version with a certain spices mixture on proportions or strictly, uh, strictly follows uh, the created instructions. Making Krupnikas is uh, much more than a physical action uh, based on following precise instruction. As I make it, I still remember that. Here is his recipe, uh, says one of the respondent. Although I, I could ever make uh, it from memory, I still intentionally put uh, the leaflet and count uh, line by line what follows. I do that on purpose. It is like a relation with my dad, you know, says 79 years man. Thus, every time this drink is prepared, the uh, connections with uh, the older generation of the family re reestablished and maintained, and uh, the preparation process, according to the respondents, becomes a kind of ritual. The uh, connection with the past and ethic roots continues further. The young generation of Americans, Lithuanian children and grandchildren is included in this ritual of making Krupnikas. For, uh, from a young age, Lithuanians already go to, into that procedure, smelling the smells of spices and aroma of just prepared Krupnikas, using it during the holidays and hearing stories about Lithuania. This involvement of the younger generation does not allow us to stop the circle of passing of this tradition uh, of making Krupnikas and guarantees the ideas of support and uh, continuity of Lithuanians. Uh, so, in conclusion, I would like to summarize the first wave of immigrants from Lithuania to America has prepared uh, has started prepared of Krupnikas, which uh, continues to these days. The habit of preparing and using it, uh, which is repeated every year and uh, at the same time, and on certain occasions has uh, shaped the traditions of making this thing among American Lithuanians. In the narratives of Lithuanian diaspora, Krupnikas highlights one of the most important elements of the Lithuanian culinary heritage, which allows it to stand out in the multicultural community and at the same time better understand one's ethnic and identity. The ritualized, symbolically codified sequences of Krupnikas preparation actions express the social and cultural relations and uh, the drink itself can be considered a metonym of Lithuanianness, and it is at the same time as medium it, it can be maintained and passed on the younger generation of diaspora. Uh, these are on the insights into first and rarer 
superficial maintenance of the, uh, the identity through the practices of making and using Krupnikas of Lithuanian origin, which will allow us to continue to research and develop the untouched or touch aspect uh, of fostering Lithuanian food-based immigration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Irogita. Thank mm -hmm. you. Very rich and detailed uh, presentation. Uh, I, I know Kupnikas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am so sorry, I will to say that my English is not good and yes. I will have a help answer, uh, uh, answering questions. <laughs> Okay, okay, your English is perfect. Well, all our English is <laughs> not really English. Uh, yes, um, is there a, a question to your guitar, perhaps? Yes, please. Uh, Go on. Yes, uh, I, I, thank you very much for in, in this inspiring talk. Uh, I, I wanted to, to know if uh, in, in the American diaspora, uh, they they used the uh, elements uh, directly uh, that they could take in uh, around them in America, or did they make uh, some elements come from Lithuania? I mean, for the herbs and for the the different elements of the recipe. Do they do they, for in the botanics? Do do, do they uh, use uh, different uh, recipes than in Lithuania, or do they? have the, the herbs coming from Lithuania, or do they take them around them? Yes. 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 They take uh, the spices mostly in uh, in America because the spices for Krupnikas, uh, as uh, it was, uh, as I also saw, they are international. And, 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 the, and the honey is also from America. Okay, okay. So, yeah. thank you. Interesting. And maybe another question? Nina? No. Yes, may I? Oh, oh, Tatiana, maybe you first. Yeah. Very Tatiana. Very short question. Maybe Yurgita thought about it. Thank you, Yurgita. Uh, etymology of this uh, word Krupnika. Hmm. Etymology, Kostasir. Kilma. Ah, Kilma. 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 Kiek man teko domėtis, tai žo, pavadinimas krupnikas kilo nuo veiksmo lašėti, nes krup, na, krupnikas la, yeah. lašai. So, in general, yeah. if we are talking about the name of krupnikas is related to a uh, uh, word drop or krup, uh, just from okay. dropping. Okay. Yes, so this is um, one of the... Atsiprašau, ar tai reiškia, kad šitas žodis baltarusiškos kilmės, o ne lietuviškos? Taip, tai nėra lietuviškos kilmės žodis, taip. Yes, yes. Okay. I would like to ask one question about yeah. it is possible. Yes, yes. I for, I, Nina, yeah. About, I would like to ask about very traditional Lufenian alcohol drinking medus. What mm -hmm. the uh, medus, uh, what the difference between Krupnikas and medus? Medus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, didžiausias skirtumas yra tame, kad um, medaus ganybo yra naudojamos mielės ir jis yra rauginamas, distiliuojamas. Tuo tarpu Krupniko gamybo yra naudojamas tik tai alkoholis ir uh, stiprus prieš koninių žolelių nuoviras. Ir nėra rauginamas šis gėrimas ir jį galima vartoti iš tikrųjų, na, valandos bėgyje po, po, po išvirimo. Tuo tarpu, norint naudoti midų, na, jį reikia dar užimais ilgesnį laiko tarpą gamyboje. Uh, so short in English, uh, the answer would be like uh, the difference between mead and uh, krupnikas that uh, in, uh, in meat production, it's used a yeast, which is uh, dedicated for fermenting this drink. 
Uh, and in Klupnikas is that you use a strong alcohol and make a mixture with honey and spices. And in general, it's not fermented. So after preparation, okay, maybe a filtering, you can use it straightforward if it's cold. <laughs> Nina, did you have a question? Uh, yes, a short question. Thank yes. you for your presentation. Um, uh, tell me, please, <clears throat> is there a um, production of Krupnikas uh, in Lithuania? Uh, so like a plants of alcoholic, massive production of Krupnikas in Lithuania, or it is a only homemade uh, Крупника для того, чтобы именно продукт индустриальный. крупника бегамина. Ты для того, чтобы откатить жмоня с гаминту на ты как по Америку или ты вегамина. Не так он гердеть. Те са пати гавуси рецепты из Америки с лету аж и побанжу на мя на мя погаминти и рестикрую на и дома с гермос, и рыска с гермос. В Литве, так и в Беларуси промышленное производство развито, да. В Беларуси тоже производят. Mm -hmm. Yes, in short in English. So in Lithuania we have Krupnikas uh, produced industrially. We also have a bottle in, in, at home. Uh, and um, the other thing is that we have uh, tried to do it at home by the recipe which was presented during interviews. Yes, and um, yeah, okay, it, it, it went well. <laughs> May I have a yes, please, a question? Irina, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for a fascinating paper. It shows that drinks are very important for our identity. Russian vodka, Bulgarian raki, etc., etc. My question is, when do children or teenagers start to try this wonderful liquor? Yes. <laughs> Ну, как, ну, когда пройдёт, да? Айшку, Prieskonius, jie jaučia tos prieškonių, prieskonius išsako nuomonę, kuris labiau kvepia, kuris mažiau kvepia, jie užuodžia to verdamo krupniko kvapą, todėl nuo pat, nuo pat mažumės jie jau jie atpažįsta, tačiau ragauti, žinoma, jiems leidžiama tik nuo pilna metystės. Ne, nu, dvi šimai nėliau. So, if we talk it in English, so... Uh, generally, the, they are allowed to taste it uh, as way as they are, let's say in America, it's 20 years old, uh, allowed, so from that age. Uh, and uh, But um, they are participating from a younger age in the preparation, it, uh, smelling spices, maybe understanding what spices are used. Uh, and... Um, and yeah, and uh, smelling the aroma that they will afterwards, then they will grow up, they understand that this is the same uh, drink. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay. We, you, you see in the chat that uh, Laurent Sebastian makes a suggestion to Dragita. You, you can read it to mm -hmm. the Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Well, I see it's it's about time to close this session. If if you all agree, then I do close the session and give over to Silvitis. So thank you very much uh, for John Helsworth, uh, and you have uh, had the most difficult task. Uh, it's uh, five reports. Uh, thank you very much.